everyone we're on the internet <clears throat> russell you got sound there buddy oh no no russell i do not hear you Wait, what happened yeah i saw russell i saw russell was sound something happened to russell's system there uh he has some kind of reboot i saw something happen with his screen while you were running just before you the credits started oh, he came no. back on and his uh <laughs> his sound was out so he's off right now welcome everybody to the game. Welcome. And Russell's going to figure out his mic problem and get on with us, I'm sure. All right. Well, if you're just joining us, uh, looks like we have some viewers here with us. We are a tabletop talk show and podcast brought to you by Dungeon Studios. We go beyond live play and dive deep into every topic from session zeros to campaign heroes. <laughs> With lively debates and thoughtful analysis and plenty of laughs, uh, our weekly podcast is the perfect companion for any D&D fan. We stream live and interact with our chat on Facebook every Monday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, and at a certain time in New Zealand, which I can't remember what time it is. <laughs> so... Tonight we have with us our ever, ever popular Dr. Platorius. We have Russell with us, and he is trying greetings. to figure out his sound, and I am Giddis. Yeah, greetings, everybody. Uh, we are trying to figure out what's going on with Russell there. We have him on Discord. Does he need to rejoin Streamlabs, possibly? Uh, that's that's a possibility, yeah. It looks like he might if be you can trying hear that. me. Everyone who's watching, and come back in. we did extensive testing, as I think Upright Man has commented. <laughs> we did extensive testing because we had so many technical difficulties last week. We really, really tried to hammer everything down. Everything was running smoothly. And, you know, wouldn't you have it? I think uh, somehow we got jinxed right before we started. <laughs> no, this is this is a typical, again, the 21st century. We have all this technology <laughs> and none of it works right. Uh, Too much just, technology. Uh, yeah, I was at the doctor's office today, the same thing. When you brought the paper file, it worked, man. When you have to get it now from the internet. Still don't hear you, Russell. He's counting down. Okay, it oh, looks like he's, he's going to rejoin. He'll be, he'll be back with us shortly. All right. Let's so, uh, so it's funny because it looks like you were going to apologize for difficulties uh, last week as the retcon rewind uh, topic. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted, I, I wanted to let everyone know, because on our Facebook page, there's going to be three different yes, video are. files. And okay, I can hear you, Russell. Let me transition real quick, see if we can get him yeah, this on. This is going to get her online. So I thought that was oh, so he disappeared. funny. Hold on one oh. second. I think I know why. Yes, there we go. Okay, we can see him. Yep, Russell, you're in with us. Can we hear him? Oh, I, I think can I hear him. Testing, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Testing, I think you testing. sound good. Hey, chat, let us know if you can hear Russell. Please tell me if you can hear me. We're good. Okay. Woot, woot. Oh, Sounds that was like stressful. we're good. <laughs> yeah, so, Russell, I'm sorry about that, buddy. I mean, it was like the last possible second that happened. I know, oh, right? I, I was like, I'll just move my microphone a little bit closer. And then I saw a little notification pop up that said um, USB device not recognized. I was like, what the? <laughs> what and happened? then it's like, I saw some kind of like logo screen. I was like, what do you go to some kind of reboot? Uh, yes. Yeah, I had to up. disconnect my camera through Streamlabs. Okay. And that's blah, what it was. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry about that, everybody. But we're back with you now. Uh, we're here. And again, we, we were apologizing for difficulties last week. So, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Oh, so we what I wanted to say. Yeah, what I wanted to say was that um, on Facebook, we have three different yeah. files, uh, but on our YouTube, when that video gets posted, we're still having technical difficulties getting this one posted, but when we get it posted, it's all, you know, mashed together. There's not going to be, you know, any of those uh, lags in there, so. Nice. Anyway, moving on. I wanted to let everybody know out there, uh, Facebook-wise, I've sent out a few emails to some Facebook admins if they want to come on the game with us and talk about their Facebook page, how they got started in the game themselves, and how they started running a Facebook page. There's a few of those out there. Those people have never responded to me, so I wanted to say that. Uh, 
And I also got a, another wave going out to some YouTubers. So if you're out there, uh, want to join us on the game, uh, make sure you give us a shout. All right. Yeah. What about you, Russell? Anything for Retcon Rewind? Anything from last episode that you want to address or say? Or <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I'm not off the top of my head. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought, I mean, I'll, it'll be interesting to see the, the cut video. I'm really excited to see that. Um, we, I watched the some of the video with, with my wife, and she was quite impressed. So, Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah even nice. with technical difficulties, we managed to impress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we do have some we do have some lasting quality here yes we do yes, yes we right. do well and in the video i ended up downloading this little like technical d or technical difficulties blip so every time that i have to mash the streams together there's just this little me you know like the, your tv went out for a second <laughs> right <laughs> bit of static or something like that is yeah it? Yeah, I think it actually cool. has some kind of a person on a loudspeaker saying, like, get to a bomb shelter or something. There's like a siren blaring. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. moving on to nerd news. I only have one little piece of a thing because I know Doc says I like to promote, which I do because That's I okay. think I, it's, you should it's be. well, it's, you know, it's I okay. think it's things that people want to hear. Our audience anyway would want to hear. But um, one of the things I did want to share is I found out that the Stranger Things D&D starter set, um, you can download the PDF instructions for that for free on Hasbro's instructions website. Now, I checked it out because I thought it was going to be like a free Stranger Things adventure. Uh, unfortunately, I was a little disappointed. It is but it is, I think, could be helpful okay, for. That's weird. Uh oh. Something oh, you happened. heard the sound. Yeah, that's uh, that's a sound. Got no, two. Russell has two Streamlab streams running right now. Okay, I, I would leave? close out the first one. Right. Uh, oh. Hang on. Hang on. Did that solve it? Yes, it did. Okay. Cool. Wonderful. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Okay, so the Stranger Things uh, PDF download, if you go to Hasbro's instructions So it's website, not an adventure, you said. It's, it's not, not an adventure. It's not an adventure. It does, so what is it? It's basically like a, a primer for people who want to get started. It goes into the basics of how to play D&D, &D, all the different... It's, it's like a miniaturized player's handbook with a handful of monsters, okay. a handful of characters, a handful of stats and things like that, and explanations on how to play it. So I wanted to share that just for those folks who are new to D&D &D and want... Like what's in there, right. Yeah, and just You could buy any starter set. You wouldn't necessarily have to buy the Stranger Things starter set. Exactly. But I have a feeling this is their path, though. Yeah. Because I think there's going to be a Scooby-Doo starter set. Really? There's go are you Russell, serious? Russell keeps laughing at me. Are you serious? <laughs> is that a hundred a hundred percent IPs are going to start bowing down right. to to the rules to the rule set that Hasbro has? I mean, right. there's no doubt. I mean, I the only one that may not bow down is Disney because they didn't think of it themselves. Unless, well, <laughs> I keep saying they're going to buy it anyway. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry. Okay. So anyway. Uh, so on to other news. Did you have anything else to say about the Stranger Things starter box set? No. Would and you like recommend said, another starter box set for someone? It's not a box set because you're not going to get any pieces. You're just literally getting a free PDF. So I just thought it would be helpful oh, okay. for people who are new uh, to the game. So, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So I had a couple things uh, in nerd news. I'm a little bit slow because, you know, timey-wimey stuff. I just yeah. finished my Doctor Who season 13 with the Flux. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I realized that, you know, pretty much Chris Chernobyl just said what happened in season 12 really happened um, is really what he did. Uh, OK, so that, it's been a while because I watched season 13 a while ago. So can you spoilers anybody who hasn't seen it? OK, OK. So so it, I guess the big thing was season 12, you know, it turned out that the doctor was not this. 13th or 14th regeneration, whatever number you want to count uh, right. at this point, was some found uh, by some being and brought to the Time Lords and experimented on and then had his memory erased mm -hmm. and then went out and became the doctor. So the mm -hmm. first doctor was this person with their memory erased. Okay. And that, that reveal was given to us in season 12 by the master. Okay. 
and they wrap season 12 with the master on the front end and the back end and that whole cliffhanger thing like the doctor is completely different uh than what we expect so then you go into the flux season and they sort of wrote a very short weaving story with different characters weeping angel cyber everybody sort of yeah. like weaves through it um solidifying the story because the doctor goes on to meet this 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 person that rescued the doctor as a small child um, and this creature ends up getting killed by these really weird, surreal, crystalline, Eldrad must live kind of homage to the old Tom Baker crystal creatures mm -hmm. uh, living outside of time uh, and solidifying this, these lost memories because that person that raised the doctor gives her this watch which whenever you see the watch now it's their big foible for something crazy is going to happen or somebody's right. memories are trapped or whatever yeah and suppose it has all the doctor's memories from before we've seen you know william hartnell and of course uh the doctor takes it and drops it into the heart of the tardis and says here just disappear till we see you another day yeah and then the crystal people kill the entity, the the woman that raised the doctor, so we don't get any answers. That's right. I remember that. Um, yeah. She also is dressed like a gardener. And if you go back to the old days, she looks very much like the White Guardian. And there's a lot of hats off to the uh, key to time. Uh, because in the beginning of the Flux episode, they make mention the crystalline creatures make mention that they stop time for just a second, mm. which becomes the big juxtapost at the end of key to time is that the white guardian tells Tom Baker, he needs to stop time for just a second, but let it all go back. Right. Yeah. Or, or, you know, all chaos is going to break loose. So I kind of got the feeling that Chernobyl took that story, wound it backwards threw some old uh, stuff at us and solidified his story that there are memories before the doctor, but I don't have to say anything about it now because now it's in the TARDIS and it's become part of the TARDIS. Yeah. Thus, thus solidifying the TARDIS and the doctor's, you know, symbiosis here, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> even more so uh, moving into the next season. I guess, I don't know, is the Christmas special out? I, that would be my next episode to watch uh, and review. I think there was a Christmas special. I know the 60th special, I think... I heard it was going to be out in November. Right, they right. They usually so do a Christmas special, don't they? This yeah, there, there was a Christmas. There was, uh, Whitaker was going to have another, another Christmas special. Cool. Um, and then she's regenerating into, I can't remember his name. Uh, David Tennant. And, um, um, no, no, no. Uh, I, I, Tennant and a bunch of them are appearing. Yeah, in the special. In, yeah. in the special. But there's another new doctor. I think they're going into a regeneration. Whitaker yes. is not continuing another season. Yes. But I don't know if that's happening in the in anniversary this... episode or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know so we'll see. It's it's very interesting. It's interesting. So I'm big, no. big Who fan. Uh, and it was nice to finish that up. Did you have a question, Russell? Oh, uh, no. Okay, just wondering, just wondering. <laughs> uh, and then uh, moving into uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, I got to see, uh, you know, I had my IVIG last week, so I've been pumped up and uh, went to the same theater with my daughter that we went to see Dungeons and Dragons. Fun. Because uh, I'm comfortable in that atmosphere, you know, with my sickness and everything. So uh, I, one of the most interesting things ever, my first thing I'm going to say is my daughter liked Dungeons and Dragons movie more? Really? Wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna start my review with that. Right. Did you now, ask her why? <clears throat> was she able to like pinpoint why? Oh, I can I can definitely tell you okay. why. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is a lot more accessible to everyone and a younger age group. My daughter is 12. It's a PG 13 movie. Mm -hmm. They probably shouldn't have given it a PG 13 rating. I yeah. think it should have been upped a little bit. Um, that's what I heard too. To be yeah, honest. yeah. One, I heard one there was some confronting stuff in there. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of confronting stuff. Now, Rocket the Raccoon uh, backstory himself, they twisted into part of the High Evolutionary's backstory. 
They're initially not related in Marvel Comics, though they do cross over, I'm sure, in storylines here and there. Um, but at some point, Rocket was, you know, the bionic raccoon, right? Yeah. I mean, that's basically what it was. And actually, it was a joke um, from the Beatles song. What? When they were brainstorming characters. That's really? where that originally comes from, yes. Wow. Um, and he originally did go find Gideon's Bible. That was one of the first comic runs that Rocket Raccoon did um, before any of his backstory was ever developed. I love that you um, know his this back- history stuff. <laughs> yeah. His backstory got more developed, too, uh, during the X-Men days with Mojo, because Mojo ran a TV thing during the MTV days. Mm-hmm. And a lot of creatures that appeared in the movie were also from the Mojo days. Um, and there were also Tooths, who's a half walrus, half wheels, crippled walrus, um, comes from a 1980s Hulk uh, cartoon during some genetic modification. So Gunn took a lot of cute critters that had been modified, threw them together into animal pens, and you had to confront animal experimentation right there in your face right. uh, with Rocket as their, you know, call to arms. That's what I had wow. heard was that if yeah. you have a problem with seeing like animals die or whatever like you know yeah. do you know that there's a website um does the dog die or something there's a website for people yeah. who cannot watch movies where they know the dog's gonna die and so you can look up a movie like that's those are the people that, 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 that i really feel like you know we talk about this we talk about this with um our products about having mm-hmm. body warnings and stuff marvel should have probably put out a kind of warning yeah uh to that effect and then the other thing uh great Greatest movie since the Spider-Man uh, crossover. Okay. I will say that for Marvel. I mean, the opening scene, the battle scene, I, I don't want to go into it too much, but it's truly out of a comic. It's happening so fast and so hard and so exciting and so dynamic. Uh, really, 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 really good. Um, awesome. Well, well done. Hats off. Can't wait to um, see it. Moving on. Into wait, wait, the before story. you move on, I just want to, so there's a couple things in the chat I want to see if you can address. So we have someone who said, did you actually say that Disney should buy D&D? Is that what you said? Because I can't even remember your exact words. Was that what you said? <laughs> no, no, they're, they are, um, um, the prediction always, Merwin and I, I mean, since the game has started, we have always said Disney is going to swallow hasbro there's always a bigger fish i think was the joke uh merwin and i made um and that hasbro is growing and growing they 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 swallowed up wizards um they're swallowing up everything they yeah they're swallowing up merchandising i mean how many monopolies do you have none well (laughs) soon there's soon there's going to be like you know one company owning everything right right so that's um, anyway anyway back to back to the movie okay so so again, really, really good stuff going on. They introduce Warlock. Adam Warlock gets introduced. Uh, they slip in Phi Lavelle for those Marvel comic fans that are out there as uh, an experiment from the high evolutionary. Um, Astro, the dog, has a much larger role, who is really huge in the comics. Now, you see them in their blue outfits in the promos. Mm-hmm. That uh, was the famous comic run uh, when they all got back together um, in the 2000s. And then at the end of it, they have Star Lord will be returning instead of it saying Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh. Um, so it's a, it's a hats off to actually the Star Lord comic, which was the sales of that comic was what generated the Guardians of the Galaxy turning into a comic book in the first place. Huh. Ah, cool. because star lord comics started selling <clears throat> they combined all their space characters into one comic called guardians of the galaxy they throw them in blue uniforms and off we go how do you know all this stuff yeah because i read he... guardians because i've read guardians because of... i've read guardians of... <laughs> i've read guardians of the galaxy for for years and years and years <laughs> the original original guardians of the galaxy actually um is not even any of those characters they're a alternate to the Sylvester Stallone team that you see in the background. They're not actually the Ravagers. Some of those are actually the original Guardians of the Galaxy um, that were an alternate reality where 
think it's not the Shi'ar. I, I, an alien race comes and just wipes out the entire solar system. Don't. And it's in the future where mutants are on each planet and each planet sends a representative to try to save our solar system. Our solar system yeah. dies. They are actually the first Guardians of the Galaxy. And then it sort of rolls into all these different uh, superheroes meet this original group. And Star Lord originally joins and joins this team and becomes the team's leader. So right. the movie also does that in a way because he hands the hat off to Rocket to become the leader at the end of the movie, which is originally the comic book. They, they switch members so that switching members thing can come in. Uh, another nice thing that happens is one of the original Guardians of the Galaxy members was name is Bug. Who is can I? Act yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to say a quick shout out to Joshua Hernandez, who's in the chat. He's a yeah. friend of mine. Oh, uh, hey, Joshua, what's up? Yeah, thank so, you for coming in, Josh. So uh, Bug is actually a Micronaut when Marvel Comics had bought the Micronauts uh, franchise, which was toys in the United States. They uh, tried to use that character in Guardians of the Galaxy as well. There was a hats off to that. So there were so many Easter eggs for old Marvel fans that I don't even think the YouTubers are keeping up with the amount of Easter eggs that that he has put in that movie. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, it was really, really well done. Really well done. Yeah, I so, can go uh, on and on, but this show is not Guardians of the Galaxy. I can't promote it that much more, Amber. You should be telling us <laughs> to stop. No, I figured I had my moment to promote things. You can have yours. <laughs> No, I really, really super enjoyed it myself. But again, very dark, very violent. If it's not your movie, don't go see it. But again, I got to rate it as one of the best, best Marvels of all time. Blew, blew the last Panther out of the water, I felt personally. Yeah. Um, now, I wanted to see multiple reality Guardians of the Galaxy. Right, because we're kind like of with, having the multiverse thing happening right, right? now. Right, yeah. like that's what I really wanted to see. Yeah. Uh, and my comic heart could tell you all about that now for the next three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but that may be the future of Star-Lord. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, boy, I'm prediction. so bummed I'm not going to be able to see this movie for like at least another couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, sorry. Totally. Yeah, no, sorry. that's fine because then I can, I can avoid the crowds. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And and then my last the, my the last nerd news of course uh, I heard it on I have to give credit to Dungeons and Discourse. She's always very angry. Um, I like to watch her, but I have to like watch my Zen video afterwards to like chill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, now is that's it because you said this is franchise. like she's she's but... Irish or something, right? Or Scottish? I think she's. Is she yeah. Scottish? Is it just maybe like the accent like that some... makes her sound angry, or is she just actually? No, angry? no, no, no. Okay. That is no, no, no. It's it's. That's her stress, you know. That's what she does. She, she's like angry DM has the same sort of style. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah. it's it's dungeons and discourse. I okay, mean, she is totally a hundred percent discourse. I mean, I, that's it's so she's good. She's hilarious. I mean, she's great at what she does. Uh, mm. I in fact, hats off. Probably one of the best YouTubers I think right now. When I start watching them like i'd love to invite her on she diss us because she got enough followers maybe I'll, I'll write her what the yeah. hell i got nothing to lose <laughs> all right so um the thing she was talking about was critical role is no longer gonna use D. &D. Ha, ha, ha. okay so Sorry. i had not heard anything and i'm gonna about shut this. up i'm and gonna let you guys talk for a minute because I, I just i'm no I, i'm just gonna say i am an avid critical role fan and so yeah. when I saw this, when you listed it on Nerd News, I purposely did not want to look anything up, but I was dying inside because I needed to know how you know this and I don't know this and I need to know more. <laughs> well, I know that the Critical Role, uh, I know that Critical Role has, you know, they're releasing their own role-playing games. So there's that. They're, this, basically, since the, the whole fiasco with the OLG, OG, I get those letters mixed up. Um, since that happened, they've been kind of untangling themselves from D&D, um, &D, essentially, and from Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast. Um, and they, yeah, I mean, it seems it seems to me they're, ju they're just turning themselves into their own franchise. Why do they need to pay anybody else money? Why do they need to be involved in other right. people's you know, nonsense when, when clearly Wizards... I mean, I, actually, I was thinking we should have a segment called What Did Wizards Fuck Up This Week? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, that was that. Yeah, yes, that we do. We do. That is definitely something that happens. But that's where I feel like this story 
is all part of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, I feel like the RPG news sort of hit a void and all of a sudden now this was the story. But right. if you think about it, the whole OGL thing was about this. This was about third party creators. And, and right. here's the thing. That's what we are right now. That's what the three of us are. We're having a great, you know, grassroots podcast about what D and D is the heart of the game and what the right. game is and what the game is about. And that's what they were. And they said, Hey, let's do this at conventions. And then people started showing up and then it turned into this big thing. And they were all, you know, like kind of actors, right? Kind of actors. Mm -hmm. So, so then they're like, Hey, we can make this a thing thing. So then they made it a thing thing and they put out, set up the studio and, and everybody was watching because they already had an audience and it was a very grassroots thing. But it's not a grassroots thing anymore. Right, no, right. I mean, the it's, first season, the, even the sound quality wasn't that fantastic. You know, it was it was very grassroots, as you say. You know, very um, independent, so right, to speak. Right. Know? And I'm sure there are people that watched it then that refused to watch it now. They was like, no, this is not what Critical Roles was when it started. Blah blah blah. Right. You know, I, I think there's a lot for them to face now. Uh, Dr uh, Dragons and Discourse. Her big thing was. It's the end of Dungeons and Dragons, the end of Critical Role. And, yeah, and I don't well, I don't think it's the end of anybody. <laughs> that's clickbait. Uh, right. Yeah, it's it's not gotta, it's, yeah. it's not the end of anybody. Um, I guess their cartoon is gonna continue. She said this too. Their cartoon is gonna continue to be their D D campaign that they had run. Mm -hmm. right. They're gonna try to promote their new game. Um, but their hands in Hasbro's pants too. So right. I'm sure they're going to have marketing stuff. And he still wrote Blood Hunter for, right. for Beyond. Yeah. Probably do some crossover stuff. Let's yeah, face it. I mean, just talking about how the you know D and D franchises, people are selling their franchises to D and D now. You know, they will do a. Do you, do you remember back in the day when there was um, what was that called? Uh, the generic un GURPS, generic Universal. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right? And they had. I never played GURPS, to be honest, but they did have supplements for practically every other game. Like Vampire the Masquerade had a had a GURPS supplement, um, I, you know, a number of other games. So, yeah, I suspect it'll be something. like My that. brothers, when I, in, the, in the early 70s, my brothers got Christmas gifts. They were blank dolls, and you got the, the setup, and you put Captain America's hat on, you put Captain America's outfit on, and you got outfits. You didn't get a whole nother doll. Right, right. And it's just a different thing. It's just a whole other thing. So uh, we just had to mention it on the game that they're leaving. I don't think it's going to be a big either there or there. You have two different audiences, new audiences. Mm -hmm. You're going to have new people come to D&D. &D. You're going to have new people check them out. It's <clears throat> Coke, another Coke versus Pepsi versus Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I mean. Dr. Pepper wins, though, I say. <laughs> Now, the other thing I heard was their game, and I think this will be interesting to you, Russell, their game is a little bit more heard on the Call of Cthulhu, Mystery yeah. Madness. It seems a bit steampunky from what I've seen. Okay. Just the, the oh, images the that one? I've seen of it. Is, yeah, people standing around wearing yeah. 18th century clothes and top hats and pipes and, and lanterns and sort of gas lamps and so on. So it seems to be um, – it looks a little um, – you know, it's it seems to be clearly set in that sort of late industrial revolution period. That's just well, from and, and, and again, I, I no no ill to anybody. Dragons mm -hmm. Discourse, Critical Role. Good luck, all of you. Um, uh, our Josh, our boss here, says they can't use the name Critical Role. I disagree. I think they I think they own that sink, lock, and barrel. I think that's the first thing they bought. Um, I yeah. would think. They, they you saying D and D bought that or? Critical mercy. role, critical role. He's saying that they can't use that name anymore. That they're if they change games, we'll have to look into it. That's gonna be interesting to see yeah. which way they mm -hmm. they shoot. Because the, you know, with the anime mm -hmm. or the anime, the animation that came out, that doesn't say critical role on it. I think it just says Legend of Vox Machina. I don't think it has critical no, role's name, name on it. it. I it don't think they the have credits, their name but... on anything except for their channel. It could be in the end. Again, it could be yeah. at the end. It doesn't matter. Yeah, and maybe. it'll just have a one or a D plus soon. Oh, sorry. Did I say that again? <laughs> hey, Russell, can you do me a favor if possible? It's it's driving my type A personality. Oh. Uh, can you like put yourself in? There you go. Just a little more. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> got to send your hexagon. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I think, I think I'm confused too because I feel like he's looking at me. 
Yeah. That's right. Maybe that's it. Before. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Right. You know, right. just yeah, for yeah, everyone else who's right. watching who might want to see you. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> we were losing you in the hexagon corner there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. So that's it for nerd news. We're going to move into your week in games. And do we get a Josh update? Um, well, yeah, we got an update, um, but it's not on the same campaign for Dungeon Studios right, that they've right. been Right, right. I heard that. Yeah, playing. what's going on? Um, well, so they, he started, it's another game. Um, it's for some material that is not yet published, so I don't know how much I can talk about it yet. Um, but uh, the adventure started with uh, everyone in a sinking ship, basically. Um, and I guess Josh will stop me if I'm not supposed to talk about it, but... <laughs> Um, but yeah, it started in a sinking ship. Uh, they ended up like in the water with some barrels trying to survive. Um, and I don't want to go too much further into it because I don't want to ruin anything for when this does come out. But the oh, game... Well, I can I can definitely... I, yeah, go I mean, you can give the premise, right? Oh, I mean... Go, go ahead, do whatever you need to do. You can say whatever you want. All right. I mean, so uh, I guess eventually there were just a bunch of skill checks with, you know, the barrels and they were having a lot of difficulties, um, eventually washed up on shore of an island. And apparently this island is uh, way far from anything. So this particular game is more about, you know, being stranded on an island with access to nothing and um, uh using your resources right well um, and i think i think besides besides i think there's a lot of natural uh disasters and hazards to face that's right he did uh, mention that there's the wild magic storms that affect the island right. um yeah cool. so there's there's a lot of that but that uh this particular adventure will actually you know uh, you could so go sort of Hungry. So yeah. that's fascinating, you know, because normally like role playing games are usually group versus another group, into group conflict, right. or you have interpersonal conflict. But here we have in, in, individuals or possibly a group versus nature. Yeah. This is like naked no and afraid, and, but with DD. So there's no clear antagonist <laughs> here. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? There's no, Correct. there's actually no antagonist. Uh, it's just. Yeah, I'm not entirely certain if there will be. I can I can talk about okay. this. I know okay. I know during the, the discussion stages there was all kinds of discussions like there might be a volcano mm -hmm. or there might be a tsunami. Right. So you know, you've got to face all these real supernatural disasters with the indie characters, which a lot of them can handle some, you know, yeah, all right, right, we're going to do this, we're going to try, we're going to okay. and then now this happens and now right. this happens. No. So it's not the sort of violence solves everything kind of situation. I, I like that. Yeah, right. that's what I believe it is. Yes, yes. But you know how mm -hmm. when you're DMing and you're like, you really don't want to have to track everyone, you know, everyone's weight that they're carrying and things like that. That's <laughs> where I think this particular game is going to track all those right. like, little minutiae because it's going to be really important to, to your survival. You know, have you right. eaten recently? Have you slept enough? A good you excuse could go crazy. to turn your encumbrance on, on D and D beyond. Right. Well, yeah. And I think, and I think that that is also being recommended. Like that's the whole point to it. Right. Like, this is the point. A, play the real deal game. Are we here right. to play the real deal? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It sounds really interesting. I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah. So yeah, that's we've been we've been having a lot of discussions about that. I think, I didn't, and that was the discussion with me doing the um, basement of arcane secrets, where you don't know what CR you're going to run into if you open the wrong door. Like, I was going to say, is there is there treasure on this on this island? And I don't and I don't know what that. Yeah, I don't know what the discussion was there for the for that. I know they end up there by accident. So mm -hmm. do you guys get the TV series Survivor? Yes. Like, yes. you know, they stick yes. a bunch of celebrities on a fucking island and, yeah. right, right. and fight each other for the you know, resources. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of, yeah. I think that's, that's kind the of idea. Kind of like that. Yeah. Basically yeah. what Josh said was, uh, yeah, if you don't find enough food and you can't, you know, fend for yourself, then uh, yeah, that uh, crewmate of yours leg might start looking pretty that's tasty. Right. That's right. <laughs> so. Right. Uh, no, it's very interesting. Uh, so that's good. They, so they're testing scrolls. that. They're testing that yeah. uh, nice. for release. Yes. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Sounds pretty good. So, uh, nice. yeah, my week in games. Um, last I left you guys, I said that uh, they had found the book. They met Ayun, And we kind of had, to, like I mentioned before, our games 
cut off right at six. Like everybody's just got to go home at six. So we pretty much said, oh my gosh, we're meeting Ayun and cut. <laughs> Everybody go home. Oh, geez. And so oh, geez, yeah. the conversation, there was a lot of conversation. I know that they were going to have with Ayun questions. Um, they're still looking for another thing in the dragon turtle. And I knew they were probably going to ask her about it. Um, and then also kind of a decision to make because we're heading into the end game. They know that the BBEG is kind of on the move and things are happening and they can't take a lot of time with whatever they want to complete before they head to the BBEG. So I needed to have a, a session with them and I knew it was just going to be role play. So we met online, which we don't usually do often. I, I like in person, but we met online and just had about like two hours of role play so that they could ask their questions, get their answers. And so I can kind of get a vibe for what are you guys doing next? Because I know you want to get this thing before you go. No, to wait, the I got I gotta stop you here. Yeah. So you had your regular session mm -hmm. ended and then you had this, this Yeah. We had an online when, when session was the, midweek. When was like, that? Midweek last week, um like Thursday okay. maybe. No, Wednesday. Okay. Last week, Wednesday for a couple hours in the evening, like after dinner kind of thing. No, because I always thought that would be a great dynamic for a game mm. where you had this time where you met for a game and then there was a time where you had to meet again for your outside, you know, outside the actual role play campaign, like your individual things that happened to you or whatever. Just oh, for, interesting. Yeah, I, I guess that, that would right. be, yeah. I always thought that would be great. Yeah, oh, that yeah. way people don't I, have to travel yeah. for role play. Well, funnily enough, that that's going to tie in a little bit to my uh, Russell's. Yes, yes, opinion. that's that's exactly Everything. where I was going with this, Russell. Oh, great. It will tie into Russell. Yes. Yeah, we'll circle back to that. So we don't go to too far into that. Yes. I'm but sorry. So, go ahead. So anyway, basically, what they so the way I've set up my world, the BBEG is um, a goddess of like the the dark realm, and then there is a goddess of the fey realm. And so those are, I think I mentioned this before, this is my world's version what of heaven and hell. What level are these characters? Ooh, I want to say but... that they are 14, level 14. Okay, that's possibly. fair. That's reasonable. Yeah, so. Level, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but but cool. I do, they're actually getting ready for a level up. So by the next session, they should be level 15. And hopefully right. by the time they get to the BBEG, they're level 18 is kind of what I'm gauging. But they uh the way that this is set up they know that there is you know the good goddess the bad goddess and their sisters and you cannot kill one without killing the other like you have to sorry let me explain that yeah you can try to kill one but she won't die you have to kill do the killing blow on both of them at the same time if you're going to kill the bad one or there is this tome which this is why they were in the dragon turtle to find this ancient tome that had this ancient uh spell of you know sealing the bad god away goddess away and then she can no longer affect the material plane and so that was their that's their main plan but they also kind of have this backup plan that if this fails we have to now somehow bring the bbeg to the feywild because that's where the good goddess is so that we can kill them both <laughs> and so they have this was... backup plan <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you. I mean, were they, were they otherwise they'd have to separate to different planes and fight them, and then they'd have to coordinate, and maybe there's time dilation between the different planes? Right. I and wasn't the... sure how they were going to do that, and that's why right. I assumed they were going to go with the go for the tome. Yeah, the tome. this sounds like a go for the tome <laughs> plan. Yeah, this this idea of these sisters too. I mean, it's interesting because um, for me, um, in my campaign, in my campaign world, Sidariel, I have. The Raven Queen and Sehenin Moonbow are uh, sisters. And I'm basing this concept around the idea of Isis and Nephthys mm -hmm. in the Egyptian pantheon, um, which, yeah, it's kind of interesting. They're sort of two faces of the same thing in, in, at some level. Anyway, please yeah. continue. Oh, no problem. So they have the tome and, you know, they asked all these questions, kind of understanding this tome basically outlines the process of sealing this goddess away and it's it's a multi-step thing it's not just kill her and then do this spell like there's you have to be able to do this much damage to her you now you need to insert these like they, these things have to be embedded into her body now you have wow. to cast this spell and if you fail or if that spell fails 
then you have to continually retry or plan B. Like, you know, like you, you have to keep, but you have to whittle her down to a low enough HP that like this thing will actually take effect. And right. they, they learned that she, so her powers, um, cause she's homebrewed, um, is very much all about draining things. She doesn't, she's, her sister, the good one is like a glass cannon. She's very powerful, but like for one shot and then like she's super weak, right? This one has like super defense because she can just absorb, absorb, absorb. She can absorb your spell possibly and turn it on you. She can absorb mm -hmm. HP. Like there's a lot of absorbing things happening here. So whittling her HP down is going to be really hard. And so I, I really hammered it into the party that like you really need to understand what this entails and have a strategy. Like, don't just go in there blind because you might not succeed. And then plan B is going to go w wild. We'll see how this happens. <laughs> right. So, well, good luck. Yeah, hopefully. So we had this role play mm -hmm. session and then um, trying to think what else happened. It was just a lot of deep lore that they learned about, like how they fail. Why, why did it fail the first time? You know, what's changed about this spell that'll make it work this time? Things like that. So lots of lore dumped on them. Uh, one of my players, I felt so bad for her because she she's not, she takes some notes, but I don't think she's like the ultimate note taker. And so when all this lore started coming at her, she was just wildly confused. She was like, I don't understand how this connects to here and to here and to here. And I'm like, okay, I will do my best to explain, but then like you need to just understand that this is what I'm telling you. This is what's happening. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Wow. Yeah, but it was fun. Yeah. And... I spend an awful lot of time on law too, and, and I, I love it. And trying to find opportunities to bring it across um, to players is one of my pet hobbies, really. But, you know, it's um, it's really it's wonderful when players actually buy into it and they start looking into it and they actually start trying to find it because it's useful to them. Right. You know, Matt Wolfel has a really good video about this, actually. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. true. Very true. Yeah, I do love when my players, every once in a while, they kind of have that aha moment and they're like, oh, you did that in session one. I remember that. And it's like now we're in session like, you know, 50. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's set great. up and pay off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's it for me. Foreshadowing. <laughs> All right. Well, what about you, uh, Dr. All right. So we had a very interesting Mask of the Red Death. Uh, session with Luigi. If you remember, his face got mutilated. Mm. He had to wear a mask now. You know, he's going to like right. part horrifically, you know. Well, it was very strange because uh, he ended up, we ended up healing at the doctor's office um, and we all got invited to this masquerade um, by Peter Prospero, um, which was kind of weird. We didn't know who this guy was. Um, and we're thinking it's all tied into all this crazy stuff that's happening to us. So, so wait, you, you're playing in this game, right? You're not yes, DMing. yes, I'm playing in this game. I am Luigi Mengia, uh, organ grinder, monkey, monkey entertainer uh, in the streets. Wait, you're not originally. a monkey. You have a monkey, right? I have a monkey. Okay. I have a monkey, <laughs> my buddy. Yeah, I'm like the organ grinder. Okay. Uh, I grind an organ and then the monkey goes around and collects the money kind of stuff and does his dance. I just dances. love that character concept. What system is this? Uh, this is 5e. Uh, this someone wrote rule a rule set and guide for characters and classes to play Mask of the Red Death, the old 90s version of the 2.5 game. Okay. So the 1890s. I see. So, right, so, so gain two levels, uh, and I had to pick what I was going to do. And what's neat is you also have archetypes. So as you gain levels, your archetypes go up. So I stayed a shepherd, which is sort of like the person that sort of unifies everyone is sort of like the face of the group. Funny, I've lost my face. Um, but I also went and started in the medium archetype uh, because in the medium archetype, I would get two uh, sort of first level spells. And remember last adventure, I all of a sudden could see through the monkey, oh. uh, like find familiar. Yeah. So I sort of felt, and Russell would talk about this later in your game, talking with my DM, 
this fit into um, where my character now was sort of becoming more supernatural in this because he's got this spell. So now I got a second spell, which is like a detect good and evil uh, type spell uh, as a medium. Um, and there's a few other things because I'm third level that happened because I'm also a charlatan archetype um, as part of my performer uh, uh, as the organ grinder guy. So anyway, back to the thing. So we end up getting invited to this masquerade. We go into this masquerade ball. When we arrive, I have a normal face. We have somehow changed realities. We're going <laughs> through this rooms. Each room is a different color. Um, and then it also feels like the entire building is moving like a clock Interesting. and that we are inside a clock and we can't get to the inside room, the inner workings of the room um, where there's like, we keep trying to go to this door and then we're getting blocked by like animated armor and stuff. Now, remember we're very low level, couple hit points, animated armor coming over and like, putting the rope back over in front of the door you just get out of the way yeah you know? right <laughs> you just get out of the way right. that's um, fair but wise um as the medium and my dm knowing i was taking this medium talent and all of a sudden i'm starting to see ghosts in this place and i'm telling my friends and then the ghosts are talking to me and telling me now it's also like i know 5e I'm a third level character. These ghosts are talking to me. They're not possessing me. It was, it was very intriguing. And then I'm like relaying what the ghosts are saying to my friends because they can't see them. He was really using me as the medium, um, putting me into breakout rooms to see stuff and then going back to talk to other people. Um, so it was really, really good. Now, meanwhile, He's playing. We did soundtracks last week, right? Mm -hmm. He opens up with this like New Orleans jazz with a picture of Vincent Price with the mask of the Red Death on in his oh, face. Oh, wow. And in the background, there's a clock ticking, right? And we didn't know. We didn't realize it. Now he has the clock ticking behind us. And you can hear it. The whole fucking game. Oh my and god! How much stress does that give you to just hear? Well, that was ticking? it. Was it was really building the stress? And then he was like turning it on and off at certain points. Um, and then at one point, um, Jess, one of the one of the players was like, "Please, yeah, I don't know." The DM walked away, and I said, "Just mute him, Jess. Just mute him. Just just mute it." Because I could see it in her face; it was fucking killing her. And he comes back and he sits down. He's like, "What? What? I can hear you." You don't have to mute me. I said, it's not you, dude. It's not you. It's the goddamn ticking is driving Jess. I said it to the DM. I was like, it's driving her fucking crazy, dude. You got to give her a break. Yeah. So, so finally he did. He gave her a break. And then for some reason, there was a poem about stopping the clock. So I was doing anything to stop the clock. I sent my monkey in, got electrocuted, got killed. Then the monkey jumped back up. Somehow the monkey was back alive. I'm trying to get the monkey to pull the hands off the clock. Gets electrocuted again. Now they're all telling me, you, you keep shocking your monkey. You keep shocking your monkey. <laughs> and now he's playing shock the monkey in the background now. Yeah. Uh, and you told us that he was going to play that he's last week. Shock the monkey. So now he's playing shock the right. monkey in the background. Uh -huh. So now right. I reach in and I'm trying to like stop the clock. I get electrocuted. I'm down to three hit points now. And I'm laying on the ground. Wow. Everyone else is charmed now at this point and don't they're having grand time at the party and they we realize now this place keeps shifting in time and people keep coming into the party and never get to leave oh is this uh -huh. like a hotel california kind of scenario kind of kind, okay. kind of that's kind of the scenario so now you got to stop the clock and I, I can't stop the clock and i'm the only one that's that's past the save now um so it's all on you mate yeah so i start stuffing the chimes with coats Okay, I, to stop, the, stop the sound. Yeah. I'm going to stop it from chiming because we kept hearing the chimes as we were moving around. We kept hearing the chimes. I said, I'll stop it from chiming. And we got up to the moment of truth and the DM's like, you know what? You were working by yourself. I'm not going to tell you. He said, I'm going to tell you what the percentage chance is if you've stuffed it enough. I said, I don't want to know. I don't, I don't, I don't want to know. I'm just going to roll. I'm just going to roll. 
And I did roll and I did roll the right percentage and it stopped the chimes and the party stopped and everyone, all the ghosts dissipated and we were back in New Orleans and we didn't know what the hell had happened. And that was the conclusion. It was, it was such a great cool. session. Um, we had played in real time too. Oh, nice. So wow. that's great. It was in real time. He had the clock yeah. clicking. It was just, it was maddening. Now, the other two players were really at their wits end. <laughs> uh, being on that they failed their saves too, didn't they? And they kept failing, and he kept giving them chances to re-roll their, oh. you know, their con saves to try oh. to get out of being charmed, and and oh. you know their wisdom saves, and they just kept failing, kept failing, kept failing. Oh, and and I, I've had this too in Mammoth Factory when I did some play tests where there were creatures that give off that horrific visage or whatever it is, and you can't do anything against them. And we'll talk yeah. more about this when we get to the skill checks. Yeah. Some solutions for this you can never pass thing. Because my session was fun and great. My character was the star, but those guys kind of got screwed. Yeah. Right. Uh, in a way. Um, but next week we go to Icewind Dale, first level. I'm Ooh. playing again. Um, the really, really big thing here is I'm playing with my friend Fred, who we've been having to switch off DMing since. I came back to the game when he invited me when, since I've been sick. Mm -hmm. Well, we're just so glad to be both players again oh, uh, and have someone else DMing because we haven't done this since probably eighth grade, ninth oh, grade. Wow. Wow. That's we awesome. were both players, so we're very, very excited to both be wow. on the Well, congratulations. Team. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So like I said, we have no forever DM. Everyone has to take a turn. Good on you. I love that. Fantastic. So, Russell, Which, how was your week? My week in gaming? Yes. Well, I, I got a couple of campaigns going at the moment, and some of my players uh, play in both of those campaigns, okay. um, or at least two of them um, play in two of the campaigns. And um, so I've got one, one campaign called called Sunfall, um, where my player, Sean, and this is a face-to-face -face game, so I drive into town, and there's an apartment in town where we go and hang out on the fifth floor, and... And there was a massive lightning storm going on outside at the time. And Sean comes in, this one of the players. Um, he, he works for the Navy, actually, which is just sort of a side note. And he says to me, I've got something for you. And, and I look over to him and he hands me this envelope. And the envelope has this beautiful wax sealed stamp on the outside of it. I'm like, what the hell is this? I'm like, I can't open this. This the seal is too beautiful. I'm going to have to cut it open. So I go and get a knife from, from Simon's kitchen and I'm like, Nice. Nice. Like it. And inside it, there is a stack of stickers. He gives me a bunch of stickers. So he gives me these ones. This is my logo. This is oh, yeah. uh, it's it. your logo. That is, by the way, the Raven Queen. It's a raven. It's not fucking mountains. Okay. If you think it's <laughs> mountains, get your eyes checked. Um, or I'll send the DD police. Matt Mercer will break in through your window and we'll send you the Pinkertons. <laughs> Right, yeah, the Pinkertons, exactly. <laughs> and the other sticker was this one, which is uh, crying is a free, free action. action. Right, so I've been plastering these on everything that I own now, so that's fun. So that's after he gives nice. me this envelope, and I'm opening it, I'm looking at these stickers, you know, just drooling over the stickers, like, wow. He says, I've got something else for you. I'm like, what? And he says, well, he gives me this box. He says, it's not what's on the box. So I look at the box. This is the box he gives me, right? Okay. He says, it's not, it's not the monster cards. So I, I open it, you know, kind of like this. And I look inside. And inside there are three giant bats because we are running a scenario with a whole bunch of you, – do you know the red fangs of Shargas in 5th in edition? The in, in my game they're like the the red fangs of Shargas are like the special forces of the Orkan Empire, um, and they work for the Emperor essentially, um, but they're their own cult as well. So they fly around on these giant bats. There's three of these. They're, they're different. I'm not going to pull them all out because that would just be annoying and take too long. <laughs> but he painted these himself. They're fantastic. So he gives me those. I'm like doubly blown away my mind is leaking out my ears now nobody gives me stuff like this what a generous um, he's a player he's one of my players yeah that's, he's in two of these campaigns that's so, so kind. Th th goes, oh, i've got something else for you i'm like really what the fuck and he goes yeah. well here you go. and he, he gives me another box this one actually does still have the seal on it I love um it. so you can see the wax oh, yeah that is in. great oh and it's got gold in it too that's yeah. a real that's the real deal there you Shit, go you that's can, great yeah 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 
So apparently, apparently he's got this whole box, uh, sorry, kit for making these things. So inside this box, there are 10, count them, 10 orc miniatures that he's painted up. Wow. So I, this is like, this must be more than 100, maybe maybe two hundred dollars worth of yeah music. that's yep. that's yeah that's awesome it's and the fun. work and the work right and the work exactly and the work. players so, I mean, take notes detail <laughs> in that right you that's want to bribe amazing. your dm give them miniatures yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty amazing um i mean to be fair i've been given um other things too hold on uh where's my where's my other things that's awesome that's so awesome <laughs> Here we go. So around about Christmas, I was given these these dice by another player, um, which I thought were pretty amazing. They're gold metal hollow dice. Um, Those are great. Yeah. So it's it's kind of I'm I'm really honestly blown away and touched by every time somebody gives me something like this. It's just like wow. So anyway, that was that was a sort of side note story. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. No, I, that's that's awesome. That's 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 that was your week at games. You got gifts as the DM. That's yeah, that's yeah, cool. that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I mean, and that followed a week where Sean um, came into one of my one shots that I run at a restaurant every week um, called the Dyson Fork, and uh, he played a he, he brought a paladin, um, which I, I allowed him to play instead of a pre gen, and then I. Uh, Accidentally perma perma killed him. <laughs> <laughs> so we wove that story into the backstory of one of his other characters. So because he was the half brother of one of his other characters, so now his half brother in the main campaign is dead. So that adds a little bit of pathos to yeah, his story. A little too, flavor. So. I like awesome. it. Yeah, that's quite like cool. It. So that's that's basically the the main gist of it. Um, and he's just returned to the second campaign, which is a Zoom campaign. Um, where he's we decided in order to to take him out of the game and bring him back in again later because they're in the middle of a dungeon um basically they're they're wandering around inside this aquifer trying to figure out what these evil red wizards of the barakyle envoy are up to and um we decided we'd reintroduce him um with an illithid tadpole in his head um so he's being controlled by the barakyle envoy and but of course, the players have figured out that the Barakyle Envoy have been doing this to everybody that they know. So they've started lesser restorating. Lesser restorating? They're Can suspicious. I they are you suspicious. know what's funny is it made sense. <laughs> right. They were lucky too, because if they hadn't figured it out within three days, they were going to need greater restoration to, to fix this shit. So, okay. Yeah. Anyway, that's cool. that's the, pretty much the gist of my, my week. Um, Trying to get my vampire game up and up and running on Sunday nights, Vampire the Masquerade. So if you know anyone that wants to play Vampire the Masquerade um, once a week, um, drop me a line. It is a pay-to-play game, though, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, but New Zealand dollars, much, much cheaper. Much cheaper. <laughs> Are they? That's true. That is true, yeah. yeah. Have to look that 15 American dollars, I think, is roundabouts what, what we're paying here. Um, okay. The same thing, which we charge twenty five. Actually, it's just gone up to twenty nine because they've just become general service tax registered um, at QuestBook. So um, the, the prices are in flux. But well, they're not in flux. They've just changed. Anyway, enough enough yeah. of me talking about money shit. Yeah. Somebody say something. No, we have my 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 uh, Cthulhu has gotten loose here in the house. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm kind of a break in at any minute. Do I have to let you guys know just just in case? Yeah, we're actually uh, really clo close to the break. I think yeah, uh, yeah. we're up here to uh, Russell's segment. If he had, I think you had something you were going to talk about. Well, yeah. I mean, so I mean, I, I like to call this segment Russell's unsolicited opinion on everything. Um, as you probably figured out, that's a bit of a take on Xanathar's guide and various other guides and so mm -hmm. on. Um, so today I want to talk about one-on-one -on -one play, basically, D&D one-on-one or any other game, essentially. Um, I've done quite a lot of it. Um, I have a friend named Barry who I've spent the vast portion of my role-playing life playing one-on-one -on -one with. Um, he's he's a He has cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair and what have you. So uh, for him, D&D &D and role-playing games are like really important escapism right. um so we've spent a lot of years playing i mean i've known him for like 30 years now and we've played most of that all of that time 
yeah. <laughs> all of that time. So, yeah. And, and the thing is, like, because I've also started running one-on-one -on -one games with my wife, too. So I'm getting her into D&D. &D. Look at that. It's amazing. Yeah. She's sitting there for a long time. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> she's really resisted the game. And she's sort of, uh, I guess, after a couple of years of me going pro DM, she's like, okay, you're kind of doing this as a living thing. I suppose I should probably find out more about this and so she's taken steps into it and so running one-on-one -on -one games with people i find is some of the most meaningful and satisfying way of role playing um either D, &D or, or another game you know um no and i, I have to agree russ russell mentioned this as his topic so i'm just going to cut you off for a second russell because it's sort of the same mm. thing i was just mentioning my buddy fred same thing for years, you know, you sort of bounce off other people. I had another friend, uh, Bill, where it was just the two of us that we were the only two that could play together. And right. some of the adventures and things we came up with on our own were mm. incredible. And to not have a third person there dragging down that one person's creative explosion, it can get it can get really, really goes really, really far. I mean, the same thing right. happened in Philadelphia. I played one-on-one -on -one with a guy, uh, John, and I basically was just using first edition rules, advanced, mm. uh, a book with some maps, and we created this whole universe. He had right. built notebooks and notebooks of stuff. Right. I didn't do anything. Um, and when that one player just really gives themselves over to it, right. so and much can happen in one time. Also, because there's just two of you, I mean, like when you're playing with a group, there's a necessity to have a rule set where everybody's agreed upon the conventions of the rule set. D&D &D mm. is the rule set. You know, we're all playing by these rules. We're playing raw or we're playing some sort of homebrew thing or whatever, but it's all agreed on. Whereas if you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, you can literally play anything you, and you can make up your own rule set as you're going along, which my friend Barry and I, we did that. We've, we've made more than one role-playing game from scratch doing that. And it ends up being very story-focused, you know, and that's that's the important thing. It becomes about that character, that one character, and you spend your whole time just detailing that out. Um, the character just ends up with so much greater depth, the amount of things they can do. Um, what would otherwise be something that you would do in downtime can be the focus of a story, you know? It could be about you going to hang out with your character's um, friend or contact or what have you, and it can be all role-playing. You can stay in character the whole time or a great deal of that time, which is pretty cool. It does make combat harder, especially with D&D, &D, because, you know, one person, one they character. they go down, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't have a team, you don't have a, you might not have a tank or a healer or, or whatever, you know, some other key role in that situation. And it's interesting to see that D&D &D themselves have begun to look at this situation and like take, for example, the new Dragonlance book. Um, there's a bunch of sidekicks in the back of it, right? So you can throw sidekicks in with the player if mm -hmm. there is one. Um, or even if there's two characters or whatever, you know, you throw in a number of sidekicks to bulk up the team. Um, of course, that makes the DM's job a little bit harder because you're now playing a bunch of NPCs as well. But I, I would suggest that if you can't do that, you shouldn't be DMing. You know, you need to be able to play those NPCs relatively fluidly. But it is a lot of intense focus as a DM to run one-on-one -on -one games like that. Right. You found that too? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think the other thing is with one-on-one, -on -one, you can also have small burst segments. Right. Like especially in Philadelphia, we would meet like over coffee right. and say, right. hey, you know what? This week I, I, I want to build a, a, a fortification around, around my castle. Right. And yeah. then the next day would say, you know what? I want to take a, a week to farm this area of the land. Right. And it's sort of like it, it kind of grew out of us just like sort of like having coffee sessions. Right. And it's yeah. something else he thought about over the day that he'd say, you know, can we spend this much time doing this? Can we right. do this now? And, and, and did you ever do, ever do flashbacks or flash forwards as well? Um, I've always wanted to introduce that mechanic, but we have to finish our campaign first because we haven't yeah, started with right. that. So I don't want right. to introduce it I mean, in campaign. I don't I think I ever did. Flashbacks, 
from time to time. And I think the, the most important re thing really is that you have some kind of setting, you set plot markers or some kind of hook that says these things must happen right? because it's a flashback. There's got to be a certain, there is a specific known outcome mm -hmm. that everybody knows what that outcome is and everybody's playing towards that. Or especially if it's just two people, you know, it's easier when there's two people. And that kind of ties back into our ability checks thing later. And I'll tell you yeah. why. Good. I there. can't wait to hear about that. Um, but yeah. Um, no, no, I think one-on-one -on -one is definitely something to be considered. Uh, and, right. and the other thing I, I tried to do with my campaigns was play on Facebook, right. where you have a session on Zoom, and then you put everything on Facebook, like the maps, mm -hmm. and then everybody mm -hmm. could go there and sort of reference it and discuss it. But my right. players never really bought into that. Right. That wasn't something they they really wanted to do. It just they wanted to do it when it was happening. And I also found you mentioned the person taking the notes right. uh, earlier when we were talking. And Jess is our note taker. And it was funny because when we finished Ravenloft, she said she had something like 200 pages of notes. Oh, wow. wow. I don't, I ran the campaign. I don't, even, the book. I don't even, I don't even, I don't even have 200 pages of notes. And I, and I just, I was winging the damn thing. Right. <laughs> and, and, and then Fred run was just running red death and she's been keeping the notes for that for us too. And then at some point Fred said to Joe, who's going to run the next campaign. Oh, you don't have to keep notes. Jess will keep them all for you. Don't worry. Wow. Don't worry That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Wouldn't um, it? But now that's the other thing we're talking about this individual game. And we broke, I mentioned breakout rooms. Right. And I think yes. it is an important dynamic to break players away. Even when you're in a table setting, Go in another room, mm -hmm. give some players some information to go back to the table and decide how they want to disseminate it. That's that's a really right. important part of the game. Yeah, yeah I um, agree. If, you if know, you're I'm not playing to, the game that way, you're missing something. I'm starting to wonder if there's enough meat here for one on one games that we need to save it for like an episode. And since right. next week, when uh, we may or may not have you, Doc, that might be a good week for us to talk about one on one campaigns next week. So, but you could right. actually, you could actually play. Hey, maybe, yeah, you could you run could me play. through a quick, like, fifteen-minute one-on-one. One on one. <laughs> right, that That's could be interesting. Cool. That could be interesting because I have questions, yeah. but I'm holding myself back because I know we got to go to break, and I feel like no, there's no, a lot you got, of you got, a, you got a minute for a question or two. No, 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 but I think, but I think if there's enough material here, I should save my questions for the episode where we actually talk about one-on-one -on -one gaming. Just give us one question. Come on. <laughs> okay. We're both well, you, talking we can, about We can it. recap stuff later. We There'll can recap stuff. Okay. So uh, my main question, which you kind of touched on, was um, combat. Like, how do right. you handle if your player goes down? It, do you always well, have a companion with right. them to heal them? Or is there, how do you handle that? Right. You you have to have some kind of deus ex machina situation figured in advance. You have to have that. Or you have to plan to not have combat. Right. You know, or a plan to you have to have a solution one way or the other. There it's it's not you know the player can't die. That's what I was talking about having setting plot markers earlier, you know. You you know certain things have to happen. And I guess by that note, certain things must not happen too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like if the player play. dies, then game's yeah. over. <laughs> and and again, and it, and then the things I'm talking it's about. All are... a dream. It was all a dream. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't do that. That's terrible. No, I'm saying the things I was talking about are more, you know, outside of you know an adventure campaign as well, where you mm. talk you talk about the character's life, which you don't talk about when you're in those melee. Groups. Or, well, yeah. do, do you guys run prequels with players at all i like to have like one session with each player at the before the beginning of a game um at least an hour long because i like to make sure that i can that i can see them role playing their character and that i can believe what they're playing i you know, I, not, I, I usually I with idea. beginners i'm usually with beginners right and we are far more meta gamers than role players Right. I can honestly no, I, say that. Well, my, my games, I have a homebrew rule, which well, it's not exactly homebrew. I, sto I stole this, but this is tea for timeout. I'm sure you guys know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you don't do this, you are in character. Everything yeah. you say is in character. 
and I will use that against you in a court of law. You know, <laughs> basically, and if you say anything that's out of context or doesn't fit the mood, tone, or setting of the game, I will drop a refrigerator on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, only as a joke, but yeah. And this, this seems to generally work to keep players in character role playing. Yeah. Um, so that they're actually they they're using their voices, and they don't have to play in first person like an actor necessarily. I mean, I do. And oh I yeah. Most, no, I get that. You can be playing third person. You can be saying, "My character says this. My character does that." Um, you know that works too. But prequels are, are great in my personal view, and it definitely I want to see the character on the ground, their feet on the ground. They need to know. Things like who are their deities, who's their patron, who's this, that, and the other, the NPCs that surround them, you know, because characters, people think characters are inventories and stat blocks, yeah. but they're not. Characters are relationships with other characters. That's what a character is. And it's I think, you know what, it's, it's funny you talk about this. I think the thing that I, I realized using D&D Beyond especially um, with my Ravenloft group, because that was really the first group I'm like analyzing my players, was I could right. go to their sheets. Right. And I, and I actually used their sheets where I would put things like, you're scared of this this week. And I would say, go to your sheet. And so I think I did my little right. individual stuff, but I did it through just putting stuff on their sheets and saying, hey, read what I put kind of notes. Right. Yeah. Uh, in I mean, a way. I I kind of do that in so much as I, I want to, I, in, in that prequel, it's a matter of discussing all of those things. No, I love them. the idea. I love right? the idea. And so you get them, you get a really deep character that has motives and connections and so on before they go in there and, you know, get them to memorize the name of their deities and, and basic things like that. So when they say stuff, it sounds like they're in character. They're not going, I say the name of my, I bless my deity or whatever. You right. know, that's, that's, boring lazy role you're sort of giving them a dry run how they're gonna yeah. role play their character before they role yeah. play it in front of the people it's kind of right exactly idea. and again you can you get a chance to ask them a million questions which they then have to answer and and brainstorm with them and so that they end up role play better play. yeah it gives right. them a better role play to play yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah a, a base to to work from anyway yeah, solo D and D. Maybe favorite, maybe right? next week's episode. Yeah, as the conclusion <laughs> for uh, wow. the first half of the show today. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I it. feel like I'm going to just be interviewing you because I have a ton of questions. But this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I can't wait to make cool. it an episode. Yay! All right, I'm going to see if I can seal some seals here. You guys uh, sign off for the break. I'll be back. Okay. All right, so we're having a break, are we? Here we yeah. go. Yeah, so uh, everybody, I hope you stay tuned for the break. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching some of our past episodes, but we have been highlighting some of our friends of the show that have bands, that have put out music, that is inspired by D&D. In this break video, we have a band called Volbeat. Uh, they are a Danish rock band, is what I understand, and they are a friend of the show. Great song, great music. Um, and also in our break, we have Deception Checks. And if you don't know what they are, they're a lot of fun to watch. They're really short, pretty much crank calls with D and D uh, in it. You'll love it. Just watch real people. What, what, are, we, real what are we calls. doing? What are we doing after the break? After the break, we're going to be yeah. talking well, about skill challenges and skill checks. Thank you. I right. think that's important to talk about. Yeah, yeah <laughs> We're exactly. finally getting to our topic, folks. So stick around, yeah. watch the break, enjoy it. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about skill challenges and skill checks. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Messages. <laughs> Thanks, guys. These dice might make a count busting Never have enough All of my friends judging This one's oversized This one hurts the most Managing my heart Are you taking notes? Just one set And you're well on your way You think that you're done But you can't disobey The voice is in your head It's a lethal dose Click clack You're a dragon You've been diagnosed
Hi, this is Sean from Pers Hello, can you hear me okay? Hello? Yeah. Who am I speaking to? Yes, hello. This is, uh, this is Lord Aldor, and I'm looking for a personal trainer. Oh, great. Good. Are you in, uh, Ventura, Camarillo, or more Park? The Moore Park, but we do have a very extreme request, and I want to get that out of the way right off the bat. Okay. Are you familiar with paintballing? Paintballing? Yes. Absolutely. You see, I am an avid hunter, and so I have tracked and bagged many, many rare game. But the one prey I have yet to bag is the most elusive of all, the human hunt. So what I'm looking for is somebody who is in excellent physical shape. So what can you bench? Uh, for me, I don't know if I'm the I'm the right person for you. I have I have a lot of people at the gym though that you can hunt. I'm sure. Well, how fast is your quarter mile? We need a sprinter. It also has longevity. Now the paintballs themselves. Longevity a big. The, I just wanted to go into the paintballs themselves. That they're going to be half filled with flat latex and half curar. Uh, which is a nerve toxin, which will follow you just long enough for me to urinate on your feet, therefore marking my territory. Sounds fair enough. Uh, you should wear boots, very high boots. Uh, you will be stripped down to a loincloth and released into the wild with nothing but a compass and some fruit roll-ups, which I highly recommend that you you eat sparingly, because that's all you're going to get. How many fruit roll-ups? Uh, probably, I, I think a good half pound. <laughs> all right. So I didn't that, manage. That, that should give you the energy enough, you know, for you. We'll give you a 30-minute head start. It's going to be on an island. I own the island. It's it's going to be a great, it's going to be televised. Um, so you will have to sign an NDA. Uh, but, you know, we'll go over all of that in the contract. Where can I send that to? Sure. Why don't you bring it in in person? Perfect. Are you there now? Well, I could meet you at the Ventura location here in uh, an hour. And can I get your name? Yes, again? it's Lord Aldor. Aldor. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Goodbye. Right on.
let me go. Hi, my name is Sebastian Kamor. Uh, I have a client, Mr. D. He's chosen to grace your establishment with their presence on the 18th. Okay. Uh, it's quite the honor to be chosen. My client is known worldwide, and let's just say that their followers run into the millions. They, uh, they hold sway over an untold number of souls, so I assume that your establishment can hold a client of this magnitude? Uh, yes, I mean, I don't know what kind of request you're asking me. Excellent. He's very particular. Uh, so the expectations, we just need to know that you can accommodate the following. Do you have a pen handy? Give me one second. Sure. Okay. Uh, do you sanitize your establishment? The entire establishment? I can't do that. Oh, we do require that the door Hello? handles specifically be thoroughly sanitized before we arrive. The handle? The door handles? Yes. Okay. Uh, also, we do require that the heat be set to 85 degrees 36 minutes before they arrive. Will there be small children at the establishment? Most likely. Okay, we will just have to ensure that none of them look directly into his eyes. I'm afraid I can't meet those. I can't meet those requirements because I, I can't really tell my clients not to do that. Well, it's a small restaurant. well, let's see if we can uh, at least get through the last one, and then we'll be able to make a decision. His entourage is uh, six, uh, 13 seats total, okay? Now, they will have orders. The waitress will take the orders, but you guys will not bring any of their food because they don't deserve it, and they need to learn their place. Uh, you know, I'm afraid I can't, I can't do this. I highly recommend you take our offer. It's not, it's not about the money. It's not, well, then so what is I it really about? Must, yeah, but your requirement is what you're asking me. I can't really tell my service not to, you know, not, not, not to, um, not to serve them or not to, like, approach them. I can't Oh, really no, do they'll that. be able to take their orders. They just won't be able to bring them any food, and we'll make sure that you pay, we pay for all of the food that they bring. Uh, I can't do that. I'm so sorry. My bank account busting Never have enough All of my friends judging This one's oversized This one hurts the most Managing my heart Are you taking notes? Hi there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Wasn't sure if everybody was back. How is everyone? Did you guys enjoy that break? No. Yeah. No? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> no, no. No, you had a wild Cthulhu the whole time. I just walked back and Russell said we're on in three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> no, no, that break sucked. I'm sorry. Yeah, I tried to extend for, it a little a bit for you. you need to. <laughs> no, no, I, let's, I'll do my, I'll do my uh, visit to the doctor's office and then, uh, and then I will, uh, I will relieve myself while you guys get the discussion started. All right. I think well, that's before, probably the best way to go. Before we get started on doctor's office, I just wanted to mention in the chat that Joshua loves your background, Doc, and uh, yeah. wanted to point out that is our Dungeon Studios logo backdrop right there. Mm. Uh, there hopefully the rest of us will uh, get outfitted with something similar and we'll all have the same background in our hex. But yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have nothing. I have no D&D &D stuff except for my Dungeon Studios background. <laughs> but it looks great. I mean, you look more professional than we do. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. A triangle and a hexagon. It works. Yeah. yeah. All, All right. right. So let's uh, visit the doctor's office. What do you got All for us right, today? folks. Whew, let, me, let me find those notes, too, because I couldn't, like, pull them up either. 
uh, during the break either. That was fun. Oh, no problem. All right. So today, um, have either of you seen an Italian horn? You know, the an necklace, Italian horn. The horns that get worn on the necklace. No. I don't think no. so. Okay. How big are these things? Oh, they could be, I don't know, an inch. Sometimes they're longer, two inches. You've never seen an Italian horn. This no, is not like some traditional it. Roman thing. Or yeah, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. Google it now just so you see what one looks like. So you, so you have right. an idea what you're looking at. Uh, fine. I'll do that. No, that's Italian fine. Oh, okay. Italian. Kind of looks okay. like a so curved dagger. You're, so you're saying, oh, okay. So why are you saying, oh, okay? I guess. Well, because it, it, it looks familiar. I guess I just didn't know it was an Italian maybe, horn. Okay, maybe it's because I grew up in New York. I, I you know, Italian culture, so... We're, we're definitely going into my my cultural background here. I did not wear one of these uh, as a young New Yorker, but you know, the, all the best Guidos was wearing one of these. I'm wondering if John Travolta had one on in Saturday Night Fever. Now, come to think of it, if he was wearing uh, a uh, a one of these on, it's actually called a cornicello. Okay. 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 Um, and. They're worn actually uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is sort of like luck. Mm -hmm. And then the other goes back to actually protection from the Malorca. Wow. Okay. Now the Malorca is the evil eye. And the reason why I got into this whole uh, magical Q&A for us today is because remember I keep talking to you about Luigi Mengia in Mask of the Red Death, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the two of us are role playing these Italians and we keep talking about getting the Mallorca from different people, getting the evil eye from different people. So we have to keep going back to the church uh, every time we get the evil eye. So the horn sort of works that same way, uh, you know, casting off the evil spirits. Right. So as I was doing more research about this, it actually goes back uh, to Roman times, but it's actually the napolitans that claim where is that page uh they're actually made from red coral uh in italy this was about three thousand years ago right wow. i see some uh, red ones there on the google right and that's where the red color became popular because they were built um, uh, sculpted from red coral but you can find them in almost anything uh mm -hmm. and then reading more and more about this um, there are places where entire streets are dedicated to buying them uh, in Italy. Right. Um, so, of course, having one of these uh, for a guy, too, also gives you lots of male prowess. Right. So this They do kind of look like sperms. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 and what's funny, it's funny you say that it, it actually originally came from the Romans wearing the penis on their neck. Right. Um, really? And there's, yeah, and it's and there's still a lot of debate if it's a bullhorn, if it's a bull penis, if it's a chili pepper because it's hot. Right. Um, but there's always been a lot surrounding these. Um, but again, it's something, and I've also noticed sort of crossing into Latino culture as well. I've noticed it uh, in some of their iconic in, iconograph of religious things uh it's sort of built in there too which is weird because it looks very pagan um right. and that's the other thing i was reading about this pagan about, origins clearly <laughs> right uh, but a lot of italians clearly wear this with their crucifix Crosses, right yeah so interesting right. so it's kind of interesting too that this is sort of such a pagan uh symbol that it's acceptable um right and then if it's not acceptable you're protecting yourself from somebody giving the evil eye. So right. there's something cool to bring into the magical Q and a uh, for mm. today uh, and see, give you guys a little thought, maybe how you could add it into your game session. Right. Yeah. Like cool. This. Very cool. Amulets. <laughs> Amulets. Actually. Well, and, um, yeah. And it's interesting yeah. because it sort of has a minor power. Oh. It's not a, you know, think about it. If you know, right. everybody's got one or, um, and it's, it kind of reminds me of the emerald glasses. Um, if you read the original Wizard of the Oz, 
uh, the Emerald City, as soon as you get there, you get emerald glasses. So everything looks green. Right. That is cool. Mm. So fascinating. Kind of neat thing. Yeah. So that was the visit to the doctor's office today. What do you think? That was I think great. it's very cool. Yeah. I actually have someone in the chat who says sources to cite for research and verification. Oh, gosh. Uh, wait a minute. I, I left teaching. Well, you, you should, you should um, consult our most holy of holy books, Leave a Google. <laughs> I was going to say, I, was gonna say I, I can tell you that I have referenced at least three web pages, and it was not Wikipedia. I've crossed Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, actually, when you do look up Italian horns, you get a shitload of jewelry places. Right, so, I spent, so I spent a long time uh, looking for some legitimate sources. Uh, I, do I really have to quote them right here, right now? No, I don't do that but, anymore. Yeah. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> F that shit. Well, now we know people are going to ask these sorts of questions. We're going to have to up our uh, game, aren't we? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> well, anyway, let's move on to our topic, skill challenges. Right, or sorry, I'm going to I'm gonna take a little break since I did not get a break. So you guys go ahead. I'm going to be listening yes. in. He's failing no, his constitution saving throw right oh, now. Oh, I, I sure am. I sure am. <laughs> this is what it looks like when you roll a two. <laughs> He's yeah. always talking about when we roll one. So this is great. Right. All right. Well, and you know, I could really use Doc's history. So I'm hoping you with your experience could help a little bit with this. Um, so I, I, I feel like our audience knows what a skill check is, right? But just in case, so. we should maybe just cover the general, you know, idea right. of it, right? So when you're right. playing, whether it's D&D, tabletop, what have you, if your GM yeah. calls for some kind of a a check because your character is attempting to do something, uh, whether it's an action or, you know, right. facing the, some the, kind the, of obstacle. Right. There has oh, to ahead. be some sort of potential to fail. Right. Right. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's not just part of the story. You know, it's not just a, a, an essential part of the narrative. It could, it's got to be something where you could fail this thing, whatever it is. It's not something that you can take for granted, like walking down the street or putting your hat on. Right. Breathing. <laughs> Breathing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, what's what I find interesting, um, because I, I think between you and Doc, I'm probably the newer player, I would think. Um, and I've been playing for quite a while, but or I'm a newer DM. Uh, I find it interesting that as a character, anything that you can consider trying to do, <clears throat> you know, I want to try to do this. I want to try to unlock this i want to try to kick the door open what have you that there is some right. skill attached to it from the list of skills that have been created you know acrobatics animal handling all of that that was a very quick break thanks doc <laughs> i tried i tried no and i was i was listening to you no i i completely understand what you're saying i think modules are written and, and russell sort of hit on it right there modules are written with hazards obstacles and those are things they kind of highlight for the DM to find with his eyes, right? Right. And I, I kind of like to break outside of that mold because sometimes it's a magical obstacle. Sometimes <laughs> it's a natural hazard. Sometimes it's a trap. So these, these are different things that get built in. But the, the you were talking about skill checks. It, it sort of switched because in the original game, it was the DM that rolled skill checks for people. Now, the, the charts and everything were in the player's handbook. We were talking about this in the Discord with Upright Man, mm -hmm. uh, like for strength. Did we lose Russell? It looked like he froze. No, no. Russell's no, no, just no. listening. He's I'm paused listening. and listening. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you had Ben Bars and Lift Gates for strength. And then ben Thieves. Bars, right. And then, and then Thieves had their special, like hide in shadows and climb walls and pick. It was the assassination table. Right, right. There are special tables for I that. I never really table. understood that table, but anyway. And, and then the DM rolled it too. So he could fudge it on you anyway. Right. So, and then at some point it switched over you probably to. probably have to because your fucking percentage chances of assassinating someone at level two were pathetic. Pathetic, like, right. It was like 5% or you know, pickpockets at level five, you had like 15% chance or something ridiculous. Or something. But it, it was sort of like funneled. And, and it's just good to try. And this goes back to what Giddis was saying. I like to play, I play with a lot of beginners. I like beginners to say what they're going to do and then me decide what they need to roll. Right. Right. Um, 
And there's a lot of old players that come right to the game and just start saying, slide a hand, I pick pocket, slide a hand, I'm going to pick pocket, slide a mm -hmm. hand. I want and, mm -hmm. and they're just sort of in that. It, 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 and it's, that's the one thing you got to break out of, I think, with skill challenges. Well, yeah. really difficult. Have you played any of the World of Darkness games? No, I don't think so. Vampire the Masquerade. Here no. I am on my bandwagon once again talking about Vampire the Masquerade. It's my favorite game after all. Um, the reason I bring it up is because you have your attributes at the top of your character sheet, which include things like strength, dexterity, charisma, intelligence, stuff like that. And then you have all your skills down below. And so you've got dots that represent the number of dice you get to throw for your strength, for example. And you've got uh, dots that represent how good you are at skills like driving or perception and stuff like that. So as the DM or the storyteller, what you're doing is taking two of these, like an attribute and a skill, and they don't have to be the same all the time. You can choose different attributes and skills and add them together however you see fit to make a challenge or a, or a role um, that works. And it, it gives you so much latitude to, to do that. You, you're making up new stuff all the time, and it's fantastic. It's one of the many things I love about the game. So anyway, that's my 10 cents about it. Yeah. No, it's 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 really it's really difficult with Dungeons and Dragons because, like Russell is saying, there's two components, right? And 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 I think that as a DM, and you're saying, oh, you and Ru you and Russell are been DMing longer. I think I've always taken that into account, and I don't think I go for the skill check right away. Mm -hmm. I go for the skill check right away when someone says, "Do you want me to roll?" Yeah, you want to be a dick and roll. Yeah. Like, right. like your character already has an 18 intelligence. I could tell right. you, you know, this, yeah. right. Um, so, so would you like to fail? Yeah. I, and I like think to, to fail. And I think a lot of times character players should think about saying what their ability is first. Like, yeah, my intelligence is 18. Like, yeah. do I need to roll this? Like, yeah. what's the point of someone with an 18 rolling well, they, four? They kind of tried to address this a little bit with passive checks. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Like passive wisdom uh, perception checks and a couple of others, you know. But which... you have to you have to commit to something being that. Like a DM has yeah. to say, I'm going to commit to using the passive and, yeah. and use it all the time. Yeah. I, I find that... Um, I'll put a skill check in when it's specifically going to be a challenge and it needs to be a challenge or, or I need someone to fail to make it an adventure. I mean, right. you know, right. someone needs to be dangling from the rope to right. make it like a movie. So right. it needs some of that. So you've got I, these cinematic moments in your mind before right. you go and you, you want to build up to them and, and engineer them. So what I propose is that you use the old mean median and mode when people roll their dice okay okay so Thinking you can about maths dude you've already lost me I'm i know <laughs> i know i know so i've talked about this before okay the the the, the median is the one that's in the middle mm -hmm. so right. sometimes when everybody rolls you could just say the person in the middle is the person that solved it why does right. it have to be the person with the highest roll Right. It's it's not a statistical thing. You're not rolling two dice. There's no bell curve with a 20 sided. Right. So in your mind, you could say, okay, everybody roll 20 sided. I'm going to take the median today. I'm going to take the number in the middle. Who's in the middle? All right. Or and you don't have issues with your players being upset that, you know, hey, I rolled a 22, but this guy rolled a 15. No, but think of Think about what it is when it when you're doing it. Like, hey, we're all in a bar and we're listening to people. Who's going to hear the rumor? All right, everybody roll a perception check. Everybody rolls really crappy. Okay, who had the middle number? Okay. Hmm. So okay, the, the, the most... person who had the middle number heard the rumor. Like, I'm not going to say nobody heard the rumor because you all rolled crappy. Yeah. Like, right. I'm going to decide some other justification for what they roll. Okay, let me try this. Oh, you know what? You two rolled the same number. You both heard this. Right, yeah. Why not go with that? That was the chance that happened there. Why do we have to always base it on 20s and 1s? Right. I, I think, I mean, like on, on, on to, to sort of elaborate on what you're talking about, I, I have a similar thing with, well, a similar issue with stealth checks because they come up a lot. I don't know about you guys, but yes. stealth checks always. And you've got group stealth checks where the group's moving along. 
And I, I'm always looking for opportunities to get the players to help each other. So they're using the help action and they get advantage. I, I really try to get them to do that. And if, I, if they're not doing it naturally, I'm, I'm like trying to suggest it to them without saying it to them. You know, it means like, are you doing anything to assist them doing that or, or what have you? Um, so that they can gain advantage on these checks. And with stealth checks, that's, that's where I have the most trouble with group stealth checks. And I haven't decided yet on a really decent system, but I think maybe the median, um, yeah, is possibly the best way to do that. But I find with perception checks, I find that I get the group to roll, okay, so-and-so rolled a two. I'm like, okay, well, obviously your character's distracted. What are you distracted with? You mm. tell me why your character is distracted. Make you know, it a get the player. Moment. Yeah, make it a narrative moment and give agency to the player to come up with a story reason why they aren't, why they've missed their check. And it doesn't matter if actually what check it is, but, you know, when they fail, you give them a chance to ask them why they've failed. I think that's really important. So, Russell, let me ask you this. The mm. person rolls a two. You ask yeah. them why they're distracted. They give you an excellent goddamn reason why they're distracted. Mm. You give them the information, even though they didn't make the roll. Because right. they role played it well, why not? Right? right. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, ever, that's so part of the with, game with, too. With that situation, with perception checks, the way I run it, at least, is where um, okay, so the person rolls a two, they they're distracted. They tell me a little story about why they're distracted, and then I have in my head like three pieces of information, and the person that rolls the highest will get all of that information. The person that rolls the next highest will get two pieces and the, and the lo next lowest will get one piece of information. So it'll be like, you notice the doors open. You notice the bird sitting on the window and the doors open. You notice the 10 soldiers outside dismounting their horses that are about to come through the door and the door is open and there's a bird on the window. You know right. what I mean? So you've got like layers of information. And so the higher you get, the more information you, you obtain and more detail that might be relevant. Yeah. Um, that's just how I'm doing it at the moment, but no, that's great. So, I think I, I think I, think I love playing around with this stuff. So I mean, I'm going to try some of your ideas. I here. think it's good because the other thing, players roll that one, and they're the ones that affect the game. Oh shit! I rolled a goddamn one. What the fuck? Right. No, you don't need to say anything. I have to adjudicate what you rolled. Mm -hmm. Don't. Mm -hmm. And it sort of takes the DM out of space. I think. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I completely agree with you, but I run D&D &D and D&D &D has conventions and players, because I'm often running play games with people I don't know, right? And, and people that don't know each other. So you, I have to play rules as written as much as possible. So I'm kind of forced into a box. In right, that right. No, absolutely. I don't necessarily like it, but that's just the way it is for me. So I, I'm running it this way, but if I'm in a situation where, like, where I'm playing vampire, for example, I will do exactly what you're talking about. You know, you See, give the players what they need in order for the story to progress. Russell, yeah, I do pretty time. much what you do, but in a sense, like, if we had someone who rolled, you know, low, and then someone who rolled middle and someone who rolled high, of course, yeah, the yeah. person who rolled high gets to hear everything. The person who rolled middle will hear. I usually don't give them a piece of information. What I do is I break out... The information that person the highest role heard into chunks mm. of words like you only heard this word and these two words and they have to right. piece together what this sentence is and then the person who rolled the lowest sometimes i will tell them that they heard something completely different so that yeah, it, it doesn't even know. align yeah. at all so yeah. they feel like they heard or, something but that it's completely wrong <laughs> or it could be you notice this person noticing something yeah yeah something like that so and uh, Upright Man in the chat said uh, what he does is whoever is like closest, I guess, I'm, I think the character who's like physically closest to hearing something would hear it. Right. Um, is the way that he chooses it. So that's interesting. Yeah. I think skill checks, uh, the other part of skill checks I find very intriguing is a lot of players, when you ask, when a DM asks them to roll, they're always thinking it's something negative. Yeah. Right. So I often like to incorporate things that are positive. I wrote this one page encounter with this monolith. As you get to the monolith, it like speaks to you. Um, and then you have to roll a save. And if you fail the save, you can speak back to it. Ah. But it, that's all it offers at that point. So you fail the save and now you can spend, you get to talk to it. And it's, it's sort of a different way for players 
failing a save offers an opportunity, not right. Right. So, and, and 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 passing the save is nothing. Right. So I, I, I have a, a question for you two uh, actually on the subject because um, having played a lot of Vampire, I as a player and my and I encourage my players to do this too. I will often make private checks as a player to help me decide what I'm going to do. And if I'm playing D and D, for example, I might quietly pick up a D20 and just make a wisdom check to see whether or not I'm going to do a thing because it might yeah. be something kind of stupid, you know, like for the character. I had one DM once uh, who was really offended that I would dare to make a check that I hadn't been asked to make. And, I mean, as far as I was concerned, this check that I was making was a private check. It didn't wow. – I mean, I could have just yeah, chosen like, one thing or the other, you know? Uh, yeah. could, it's, it's funny you say that. I believe I have done that for myself when I'm like, am I doing this for me or my character? I've said, let me roll it so I feel like I'm on the side of the character. Yeah, I right. think I've done that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I don't know why the DM's saying that because, again, they gave that over to the players to roll. I mean, yeah. whether, right. and, and you're doing it privately. Whether, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm just, I mean, yeah. maybe maybe it should have been a case of um, can I make a wisdom check to see whether or not I do this thing, you know? Um, maybe I should have actually addressed the DM. I guess perhaps he thought I was... Um, you know, breaking his his authority by by making my own check without asking. Well, but that's it wasn't what I like. Was... Go ahead. Yeah. It, 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 no, no. It's uh, it, it. The thing that I was rolling for would not affect the game in any way. It's not like I had any extra agency by making right. my own check. Yeah, I was still on a thing that I was going to do. I was going to say, I I wonder if that DM has had the experience, I've had this, where someone's just kind of rolling on their tray just to like, I don't know, calibrate their dice or what have you, they're fidgeting, and then they roll a 20, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, I want to try a thing, look, I rolled a 20, you know, like, (laughs) and so I don't know if that that was the case. I hate that, though, that's that's fucking irritating when players do that. (laughs) But I actually I do, do have, I have a character um, who he plays a cleric who is just so devout that it, it has become kind of a comedic point in the game um, because he just does dumb stuff in the name of his God. Like he thinks he's right. doing right. And I guess like you, you see the paladin in, in the D&D movie, but um, he will sometimes do that where he will just roll on the side. And I know that I know what he's doing. He's rolling on the side to decide is his character going to be dumb enough to do this thing or not, you know? And I let him do right. that because I know it's it's going to be great no matter what it is. <laughs> right. I think it's sure. nice that the person's leaving in at, at to chance. I think yeah. that's that's the best yeah. part. Well, I, yeah. I encourage players to do it all the time. I mean, when um, well, I was telling you about the character that had the illithid tadpole in his head last night, um, he was asking me, you know, do I remember anything about what's around me, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, it's because after the, tadpole was taken out so i was just getting him to make wisdom checks and he sort of picked it up and started rolling with that and then he started asking me if he could make the wisdom checks himself which i thought was very cool um and so before long um yeah he he was doing this to decide for himself and i thought that was great and i really encourage players to make decisions hard especially ethical decisions yeah you know making a wisdom save to or or a wisdom check to see how you go on an ethical decision i think that's totally reasonable if you're to do for yourself um whether or not you need dm consent i guess that comes down to the dm would you say yeah i guess yeah so. yeah now yeah. it's interesting in enron we were designing a race i don't believe it's released yet the wild magic gnome and okay. how this works is uh, when you're doing uh, any rolling of a 20, if you roll a one, you build up this chance to have a wild magic surge. And of course, if you roll a 20, you have a wild magic surge. But if you roll up ones, your chance goes up. Right. So then it could be like a 19 or a 20 or an 18, 19 oh, or a 20. So the, so the gnome is going to pop, you know? And right. it's kind of cool too because it's not just combat. Yeah. So this guy could be like reading a book. And then all, all right. of a sudden, there's like a wild magic surge from reading the book. Ah. Right. Wow. I I'm, I'm, might have to steal that. It's kind of neat. It's, you can't steal it. You can't steal it, but you can use it. You can use it. Yeah, that's that's Quizzle, man. That's my test character. Wild cool. magic gnome. I was cool. really enjoying playing that hey, character. Hey, quick, quick question, guys. I, I was on the – I was looking at the Facebook stream a minute ago, and it paused because we had a break. But now I can't mm-hmm. find the stream. Oh. And I went to the Dungeon Studios page, and it's and it's 
I feel like stupid? if we were not on, that we would have heard something by now. Hmm. I am unaware. I do not stream too many things. Let me take a look. Yeah. Take a look. I'm... Uh, I can see the ad. Yeah, no, I, I see it. But us. if you're listening out there, if you're listening while they're testing skill challenges, what do you guys want to see in a module? Like, like I highlighted, they got like hazard, obstacle, trap. What, what, what things do you want to see as a DM highlighted in an adventure? Uh, I've been thinking about this because I noticed there's particular things uh, that Wizards uses and different companies uh, highlight different uh, things in their paragraphs to right. highlight for the DM. So just kind of intrigued well, to hear if anybody has any input. I, I personally don't run a lot of modules, but I am running Dragonlance at the moment. So I guess I, I quite appreciate that they have got the checks in there and they've got DCs in there, but I don't feel in any way beholden to keeping them the way they are. Um, I see it, the whole thing to me is, is a template. Um, and I, I mean, honestly, most of the time, skill checks are kind of, for me, I'm just only talking about my own DMing. When I use skill checks, it's usually because I'm being lazy. It's <laughs> because I'm, I, I'm buying time and I'm looking for a way to add drama to something that is otherwise uh, there's a lull or, you know, I can feel the pace has dropped or something. And I'm like trying to ramp up the drama with a skill check and it's lazy and it's not my best work, you know? Um, so when I'm, when I make players make skill checks, I often feel guilty about it um, anyway. Really? So it, it's great when it's, yeah, yeah, I do because I, I feel like there should be, there should be more structure to making skill checks. All right, I got I to gotta tell you this then, because I thought this was very okay. interesting. I was doing a test play with Mammoth Factory, and they were doing a wear wizard line. I think this was last year sometime. And the adventure was we were going into this underground subterranean uh, dungeon where like, this whole city had collapsed, and we're going through it, and we're exploring and you're all alone. And then all of a sudden the rats are upon you. And right. again, like you said, as a role-playing thing, they asked us to creatively come up with our own skill to avoid rats. Mm -hmm. And it sort of goes along with what you were saying about a character it gives each player agency to say how they're going to get away from rats. Right. You know, um, right. I'm going to do, I know a lot about rats. I'm going to do a history check and remember mm. that rats don't like their urine. So I'm going to piss on the ground. Like, right. uh, I love you it. know, but, but, but whatever. And, and it was neat. Are you I, talking I, from experience here? Um, no, <laughs> I, just, examples, I, I just, just making uh, this up. Just, that one I just threw out of my head. I just, made, made that up? I just okay. thought about animal urine and hunters. So it just shot out. Okay. Of my brain. All right. I'll believe you. Okay. So <laughs> I'm just saying it was interesting because we were like seven or eight people and everybody really came up with something very creative and enjoyed doing it. Um, it right. was a nice sort of like introduction for all of us as different people at a play test to sort of introduce each our characters and what our mm -hmm. how our character kind of views things or might act in this situation. Mm -hmm. The next encounter, we were surrounded by were rats and were fighting them, mm -hmm. but it made more. Especially, this was not a campaign, but they're written. These their adventures they're writing are written as adventures, so there we play everything they have written, and right. that's the first part of this adventure was to, and I kind of like that idea of being creative about a skill check, mm. and then having to roll it, and then having to face that outcome. Right. Of, you know, mm. Yeah, that's what I, I think I really do enjoy about the the skill checks, or or I I feel like I I think of skill checks as the one off. I want to try this thing, whereas skill challenges are you know now everybody's trying something, and uh, yeah, I hate it when you get that sort of dogpiling and everybody. Yes, right. yes. And uh, <laughs> good word, good I word. I do, I do. Oh, I love... stole that from Matt Colville. <laughs> oh, there you go. See, there goes Matt Colville again. <laughs> you don't have to mention him. No, he's great. <laughs> he but. Great. Uh, 
what I do love about it is it really forced, I, I, I mentioned this back in another podcast about how I was running this skill challenge and they were trying to get away from the dragon in the airship. And I had one player who was just stuck in her mind. Like, I don't understand this skill challenge. What are we supposed to do? And I said, well, what would your character Yeah, I remember you talking about do? this, yeah. You know, and she, she just wasn't getting it this one session, but we ended up having to stop right at six in the middle of the fight and the next month, I don't know if she did her research or watched YouTube videos or just put some thought into it, but she came to that table and knew exactly what her character was going to do. And it w it really forced her out of this box that she was stuck in. And what she came up with was great. Like she was like, oh, I'm going to try to, you know, uh, do a deception check and try to make the ship go like one direction. But then we're going to faint and go another direction and hopefully the dragon right. won't catch us. It was, I mean... Right. It was great. So I think that's the ideal situation with skill challenges is that it really, because everyone is trying a different skill, you know, they have right. to kind of find a way to rash, either rationalize or creatively come up with, how can I use this skill to get out of something? I often ask the players, you know, what kind of check do you think you should make for that? You know, that's mm -hmm. let them throw some input at you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now, that, that, have okay. you ever done combined checks? Will they group checks? Yes. No, no. Like, like they can't close the door. Like someone, they have to open a door and two, you roll two strengths and add them together because two people are opening the door. Right. I know that in Dragonlance, there are certain situations where you need two characters with a combined strength of blah to do a thing. You know, so you have to have a combined strength. But well, I was saying consider that for mind. other other things, mm. like when there's a tome or something, and two two people do an intelligence check, and maybe they can combine. The, they had a six and a and a thirteen. Well, you know yeah. what? Together, you figured this. Mm. You were able to figure this out. Yeah, I, right. Something I else love to that. Consider. I have never thought to combine skills like that. Like you know, two mm. people need two keys to to you know turn on the bomb right. kind of thing. Well, I've, always, I've yeah. always felt that way where someone could be an investigator and someone is perceiving, right? Mm -hmm. You know, someone is really investigating the, mm. the couch and someone else is like, well, you know, I pers I'm kind of just like noticing that the couch is on an angle. angle and the door is yeah, open. Yeah. yeah. So those are different things. So those things together mm. might notice something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why I to, that too. You know, the obvious analogy is, you know, you know, a weak person by themselves can't lift the stone. The strong person isn't strong enough just quite to lift the stone. But if they work together, they've got enough combined strength to lift the stone, you know. So I mean, it could work for research too with intelligence, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great idea. I do, I mean, I, I let players use the help action quite a lot. I could probably let them abuse it, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, but um, yeah, combining. I them usually like that, let I my players do that there. too, but I I do if it's questionable, like okay, the rogue is trying to help you read Arcana. You know, like mm, yeah, no, how are you helping? Justified. They have. <laughs> can I ask yeah, a question? You what can are I, you doing? I was going to ask a question though. Is is the help action for help for skill checks or for melee? Either or. I think it's both. Yeah, in five e. Yeah. Yeah, you think I heard you say I think so. Well, I say I yeah. think because again, yeah, okay, I feel I'm like I'm the less experienced DM no, in this like, room. No, I, you, can, you can use the help action to distract, for example, in melee. Um, right. Like for example, if you've got a familiar that can't actually attack, it doesn't have any physical attacks. You can use your hawk or whatever to fly in the face of the enemy and distract yeah. them, giving you advantage. Or you can yeah. help the next person in combat in melee. You can yeah. help the right. next barbarian attack by distracting the. Right. right. Yeah. All right, yeah. I was just wondering. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna have to look that one because I don't know either. I didn't. I was not aware. I, I don't certain. think I. Really sure I don't really feel like I have people ever helping during skill checks, though. So that's something I'll hmm. I'll take to my game. Yeah. Uh, helping yeah. for a skill check. Just just make sure you ask them how are you helping? What is right. it that you're doing to actually help? And and like they, I get this with persuasion checks all the time. Players saying, you know, I, I, they're trying to convince somebody of something or another, and then the other person's. Um, breaks in and supports their argument and that might be the help action to support their argument for their persuasion so if they're sort of saying you know like a guard's trying to bribe them See, again is that is that a help action or is that another persuasion 
Is that someone else? Is that a combined? Right, I'm right. wondering myself well, now. It's interesting. Well, I mean, me mechanically, from a metagame point of view, the players, from the player's perspective, they want to have the player with the highest persuasion rolling with advantage rather than two players with different persuasions, one high and one perhaps lower. Because yeah. then they've, they've, you know, statistically got a better chance of succeeding if the person with the higher skill. Yeah, no, absolutely. Gets to do it, so. Which is, that's kind yeah. of a, I don't want to say it's a downside, but it is something that a DM has to be prepared for when you have players that do that, you know, like uh, with skill challenges, they're like, oh, well, uh, my highest skill check is intimidation. I'm going to in intimidate the dragon like you know like because they know <laughs> right. that they have a better chance of that well, than doing yeah, something I mean, else th it's, <laughs> it's like you're trying to persuade a guard to let your friend out of jail yeah. the guard is not going to let your friend out of jail there is no persuasion check that yeah. will succeed at that you know you just can't it, unless you know then there might be something you can do like bribe them but if the character if you've decided the npc has a heart of gold or, or, or you know, fixed sort of ath ethics and, and, you know, what I'm saying there's, there's no way around that. There are some checks you cannot pass. You can't jump off a building in water deep and land in Neverwinter. It's right. not going to happen. You know, right. you can roll a fucking 30 with a natural 20 and plus 10 and it's still not going to happen. So now you're making me think of the other thing now, Russell, the same thing with skill checks. You're climbing a wall, the same one, you roll at five feet, you're not going to get hurt. But if you're a hundred feet up on that wall and you roll a one, you're yeah. in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's so de degrees of failure. And I mean, if you heard the phrase failing forward. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. So you, you, one skill check leads to another skill check. I often do skill checks that unlock other skill checks. Yes. Too, like I do do that. Absolutely. Check. Or, yeah, to in order to do an arcana check, you have to investigate and then you have, have to have perceived it first. Mm -hmm. So there might be three checks to get the actual final bit of information. Now, I have noticed I've been kind of embedding that into my um, basement of arcane secrets. You need both religion and arcana to unlock a lot of things in this basement because you need right. both, you need both knowledges. You can't just have one. Right. Uh, so it's kind That's of great. interesting you're talking about that too. Yeah. Uh, double skill checks. How do you deal with like difficulty ratings? Do you do you go into the game going, okay, I know what the difficulty rating is. That's it. That's what the dice have to say. If it doesn't come up, it's going to be a fail. Or do you have more flexible kind of? I think I think I'm really more flexible based on the story. And then mm. and then if somebody rolls really low, I will change the narrative. I kind of. I always go with, oh, well, it took you a long time. Or, right. Well, they or used to made... have that take 10 thing, didn't they, back in, in was yeah. it third edition? Or, right. So you could take 10 minutes to succeed at something if you failed it. Yeah. It so that's what I would minutes. do. That's what I usually do is I play it off as something like that. It took you a really long time. Or everyone else had to right. watch out while you finish this. Or everyone else right. is annoyed at you. Or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Right. It, for me, it depends. Because if it's, uh, let's say it's some kind of a, a treasure um, chest that they found. And I know right. that whatever's in it isn't really important. It's just loot. There's nothing that's going to, you know, right. get Not the story break the game. to move. Any. Then if they can't unlock it, then I'm like, sorry. You know, like you're going to have to think of right. another way to but the chest or whatever. But now it's got a potion of greater healing in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what about this? Um, we were talking about the trap with those two players I was with this week in gaming, uh, my week in games where they could not get out of the, they're charmed and not doing anything. Right. I feel like that's a flaw for players. I'm not sure how you help a player who's in that situation. Well, so is it one of those things where, because most, I think with most charms, if you were in battle, then every round you can try to break out of it. Right. But they and kept, they kept it. rolling. They kept rolling at disadvantage. He had them rolling at disadvantage as well. Because, so okay. they kept not passing and they were good well, spirits and good sports right. and saying, I got more drinks and, so the from a role player's perspective, the answer to it, which the DM is going to have to suggest to them or otherwise kind of create the opportunity, is to play into that. And how does your character feel about failing at this? This is an opportunity for you to role play because mm -hmm. that that is a that is a type of drama. Conflict is drama. Inner conflict is drama. Here is an opportunity for you to role play your inner conflict. 
Um, so you have to see that as an opportunity to bring more out about your character, to That's, reveal your character. Now, you know, now that you say that, and I didn't say this before in the week in gaming, but now it makes complete sense. Jess was listening to the clock. She was charmed the whole time. She actually got out of the charm. Right. She didn't waste one goddamn second. She pulled out her gun and went right up to the guy who invited us and shot him. Right. <laughs> And, and it was funny because at, at the end of the adventure, and then she got charmed again, by the way, after she shot him, she, she got charmed again, but you're right. It played into the story so well, because at the end of the adventure, he's like, well, if the chimes hadn't rung and you hadn't killed Peter, he would be here to explain it. But she killed Peter. So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> right but but you're right that built up her drama it did build it did build her drama i just feel like sometimes it, it's a downer for players i guess yeah for sure for sure the player you know has to is. be willing to take that step and yeah. play, play out it, play it out and, and play it into the game so it's part of the story more right yeah. part that's of the story the way, even though it sucks because and it's because gonna be, otherwise they feel like they're playing a game that they're losing but if you're incorporating what's happening as part of the role play there's still this kind of level of participation that it yeah. i don't know it changes it somehow yeah true. yeah i mean that's it's like you know as i said before with the perception checks it's like you know why what were you paying attention to what were you thinking about when you failed this why were you distracted what were you distracted by i i suppose you can adapt that idea to most types of challenges Mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. I wonder if it's like a karma thing too you know if right. you're good role playing maybe you'll get a good role afterwards if you're a big crappy role player you're going to keep rolling really crappy right yeah well I mean I, I, I've got a few players that really lean into their failed checks and I love that you know it's like uh, I had one oh, I think that's great I, yeah right one character last night dives into this pool after this uh, water elemental myrmidon and he's like trying to follow it but he he makes a survival check underwater in the dark and goes rolls a natural one and goes completely the wrong direction and starts swimming the other way up the channel uh -oh. you know and this is in the underdark so yeah but he leaned yeah, into it a, and that was yeah great. and he I didn't worry about the repercussions of it he just no. did it so I had a character, you mentioned something about failing up, and it reminded me of this uh, player that um, he created a rogue, but basically he he wanted to play it so that anytime he succeeded at anything, he wanted it to actually look like it was an accident. Like he tripped right. and accidentally killed this guy that he meant to kill, but you know, he tripped and then somehow right. the knife like landed on him and he played it like right. that every single time. But then when he really, really failed, like it it was awful every time that it failed like he would narrate it and it was the worst thing that could possibly happen and i didn't make him do that he did that to himself but it was right, so right. much fun <laughs> yeah right exactly it's this drama drama is conflict yeah. and that's the, the the idea of escalating conflict too with the failing forward like you fail your first check um, you, you're walking across a tightrope. I did this to a player once. It was terrible. You're going across a, a rope, across a chasm, right? And the, the failure dex check. Yeah. Okay, so you trip and you fall. Now you're you're on your knees on the rope. Okay, right, um, right. you have to make another check. Um, and now you're dangling from the rope. Okay, so then you fail again. Oh, my God. Now you're, like, falling down the chasm. You can make some sort of check to try and grab the sides. You're already taking damage now, mm -hmm. right? But you haven't fallen all the way. And in the, that particular case, I mean, he failed like four times. Wow. And I said to him, dude, your character will be dead at this point. However, let's talk about this after the game. Um, and so after the game, we talked about it and decided whether or not his character died. And he decided that he would take it because it's what happened. And I thought that was very mature because I gave him an opportunity to get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> but I like that. yeah, raising the stakes with every failure rather than just going straight to the to the you know straight to the pit so to speak right that give them an opportunity to climb out of it but it, but the stakes are harder it's more difficult they they might have to humiliate themselves and ask for help god yeah. forbid <laughs> i think it's neat that that player took that after you actually gave them all those opportunities too and then you're even like oh well could we do something no no you gave me plenty like the rope i fell and done yeah oh.
Yeah. I really what like, I'm looking at the notes. I like some of these you got from Facebook. Oh, what did I get? Oh, these yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So that's yeah. what I wanted to get to here. So yeah, we've kind of been talking really a good. lot about skills and haven't really, I mean, skill challenges in general. Um, but I definitely wanted to talk about this because I, as a DM, I'm starting to wrap my brain around running skill challenges. But it was really hard in the beginning because I wasn't understanding. Well, can, well, what's challenge. the difference between a skill check and a skill challenge to you guys? Well, so to me, like I was saying, to me, a skill check is one player saying, I want to do this. And then I right. make them roll for a skill check. A skill challenge, right. the way that I understand it, is more like instead of taking a, a combat encounter, you kind of take mm. it out of combat, let's say, and now you turn it into like a story within a story. You are narratively, so let's say um, they're escaping the volcano and there's minions going after them, but now the volcano is about to blow and they got to get off the volcano before they either get, you know, attacked by the minions, hit by lava, you know, fall under a collapse of rocks, what have you. And so right, right, instead right. of having to narrate every single thing and every single person is making a check you just kind of say okay you guys are running and then this is now uh what are you guys going to do what did you say doc like what are you guys going to do to avoid the lava that's right in your path you know and give you me have, an example yeah Everybody give me an example how you avoid lava in the path right, right you right. know somebody says oh i want to try to uh jump so you give uh, them each a different check for that uh, I make them basically choose a different skill. They they all can't use the right. same skill. Um, and okay. I, I let them go one by one and say what they're going to do. Because sometimes there's somebody that wants to hang in the back and be like, if this person fails, I might like try to help them or, you know, I'm going to thorn away. This is very similar to the, the wear rat example right. I was talking about. Right. right. So that's how I see a skill challenge is it's kind of a collaborative effort and everyone is rolling um, now that's the thing is i wanted to I, I was looking at the evolution of skill challenges because apparently it wasn't um that everyone in the beginning it wasn't that everyone had to use a different skill is i think that's what i understand there was initiative involved and no one could pass their turn but there was no rule that everyone had to use a different skill and then i think huh. as it evolved it turned into okay now I'm going to present an obstacle course for you. And there's so many passes and so many failures. And if we hit three failures, you guys fail. And now narratively, I'm going to take this in a different direction. And so uh, that's where I'm at with my skill challenges is I'm learning. I, I was struggling before with, okay, I really don't know how this is going to go. I'm going to present them with a challenge. I have no idea if they're going to pass or fail this check or this check or this check, how do I mitigate that on the fly? Um, but I'm, I'm getting a lot better at this. However, I have in our upcoming segment with the uh, weekly world building, I have a skill challenge that I would like you guys to help me craft because I've been thinking about mm -hmm. it for a long time, but there are some mechanics that I can't quite, I just want to make sure looked. it makes sense. I will help. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, so, yeah. but before we get to that, um, I did, I, I, before we, before we get to what people on Facebook said, was there anything else you guys wanted to talk about with the, the skill challenges or the skill checks? The only thing I would bring up is like, and it might be a whole other subject and that's how do you deal with critical successes and critical failures and, and rules is written. There's no such thing with skill checks, but that's true. You know, you don't, rules is written, schmitten. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard to deny someone when they roll a nat 20 and they're so excited, like, you right. know, <laughs> right. so I, I, I don't know. I kind of, I'm kind of mixed on this. I feel like the nat 20 was always a combat focused thing in the beginning and skill checks were based on your ability scores. Right. Well, it used to be your skill checks were percentage chances anyway. Yeah. It? So I, I still kind of, I still kind of feel like the nat 20 thing isn't, all right, so, you, so so what you read it with panache? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, to me that it doesn't matter, um, and and that's yeah. part of the reason why people have a problem with when they roll a thirteen and they're the highest roll, and you give them the information. Yeah. Well, the thing is too, like this raises the next question: is like as far as DCs are concerned, is there a uh, point in rolling 
making making players roll when they can't succeed on something. Right. Like no, if you that's know that it's just too um, difficult for them to do, because I make them do it, um, which a lot of people object to. Yeah. The reason I make them do it is because I, I want to see the I want to see them fail and and the tense you know the now, now that now that and might be moves. that might be a scenario where I use the critical success as hey you know what you couldn't pass this but you rolled a critical I'm gonna let you out yeah. right that'd be really dramatic I mean right exactly yeah I mean and and natural ones I mean I think that there are opportunities to to have a like a a critical failure like for example you're driving a you're driving a wagon you're making an animal handling check there's a cliff you know you roll a natural one you know what's going to happen no, the true. Is gonna fall off you're going <laughs> to you know the it's going to be bad you know there's a place for that i feel yeah. well i i i feel more there's even a place for that with three two one 17 18 19 i mean if you're going to play right. that game you can right. play that way too. the Wide right. the gap. I mean, yeah, if someone rolls a four, that's still pretty bad. You can and still narratively turn that into something. And I think that's the point you're trying to make. Yeah, the numbers Whatever need people... to mean something, right? Yeah, actually, that's all what yeah. you roll has to mean something. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you roll. You got to make it mean something to the game, what's going on. Right. That's a great point, Russell. Yeah, great now, point. to your point about like, um, oh, well, I make so them roll Joshua anyway. Hernandez says he doesn't see the live thing on the page anymore for Dungeon Studios either. Now, really? Is this is on the Dungeon we've... Studios page? It's on the Dungeon Studios page. I, I had sent you. Are the you link. on the headquarters or are you, are on Dungeon Studios? There's two different Facebook pages. I'm on Dungeon Studios NV. That should be the one. Yes. Yeah, I sent you the link, Russell. You should have that. So hopefully, okay. maybe you can share uh, that with your. your all friend. right, I'll copy that over. Copy message link. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. We are we are like broadcasting in lots of time zones live, so you know, yeah, right. Everybody right. listening is is able to listen. So give us a minute. It seems like the sorry about that. The yeah. the New Zealand uh, lost the oh shit, that's the wrong the Nevada one. there. Is it? Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, well, while we're because uh, I feel like we're we're going to be running a little bit long, and we still have some other things to talk about. I had a whole list of. Uh, tips for DMs on how to address the challenges you might come across when running a skill challenge. And I think what I might do is maybe just create a Facebook post tomorrow that I'll share with everyone on the Dungeon Studios page. Is this so, the obstacle and potential solution? The, yeah, the all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. how to address. Um, is not available. That would be a cool, that would be a very cool. This is interesting. I think that would be a good Facebook post. Yep, sorry, saying content is not available. That is weird. That is weird. I wonder why. Cuz I can I can yeah. see it. On, I can see the stream on my end. You can see the stream? Yeah, oh. I'm I'm on the stream on Facebook. I wonder weird. if our our CEO uh, could take a look at that Oops. for us and see what's going on. You're banging on things and making yeah, Okay. All right. It is being looked into. All right. <laughs> We have heard from above. All right. So, yes, I think what I'm going to do is I'll just share those tips and tricks uh, on Facebook tomorrow so that anyone who's listening to our feed tonight, I want to get to some of this other stuff. And uh, But I did want to share that. So uh, We can I, add it to our next week's retcon. We can add that to our next week's retcon as well. I just hate to say, you know, like, hey, everybody, listen to skill checks and skill challenges. And then we had to maybe drop some of the material. So... Um, mm. but where are we? we? We were talking about examples skill of skill challenges from Facebook. I yes. want you to read this list. This yes. is a good list. Come on. Okay. So nine times out of 10, when I was talking to people on Facebook about, you know, what kind of skill challenges do you run? How do you apply this? A lot of them, even I have run them as chase scenes when you're trying to get away from someone or trying to chase someone because they have something you need escape from an area before collapse lava what have you but I found a few very great examples I wanted to share from Facebook Eileen said that her party they were trying to craft an artifact with gems these magical gems and so she turned it into a skill challenge where each gem that was inserted into this artifact that they were inserting required a different skill to set 
Um, for example, the first one, there was a performance to paint a representation of what save you wanted it to affect. And I'm interpreting that as whatever power this artifact has will then affect your monster's save like you know they have disadvantage on wisdom saves or something uh she didn't really go into detail but that's how i read it and then the next check to set another gem was a constitution uh check because you had to heat metal and push the gem in through the heat and then there was a sleight of hand check because you had to have some finesse to fit the gems in with the prongs and etc. So each person right. had some kind of check involved with crafting this artifact. And I would right. think that depending on their roles, she could probably come up with an artifact that maybe like it, it only works 80% of the time or something, you know, if they didn't roll very well. Uh, she didn't tell me what the end result was, but I thought that was a really great idea for a skill, a skill challenge. That reminds me of the Indiana Jones moving yeah. the idol. You got the skill check to grab the idol and then another skill check to put the thing down with equal weight and another skill check to let it go. Yeah. Right. But the, all right. Go ahead. Eileen. Uh, nice that job, was Eileen. Eileen. Yeah, thank I you. Know, that was nice. All right. Renea, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Or is uh, it Renee? Is Renee? it just Renee? Well, there was an A I, at the end. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but so uh, they said that um, for this adventure, they were going into a village and that they had to make friends in this village when they arrived. Um, she didn't give me context, so I'm in imagining that maybe they need to make friends because they need to gather information or... Maybe this is just an unfriendly village. I have no idea. But so she asked them, like, how are you going to go make friends in this village now that you've arrived? The rogue did card tricks. The druid helped cook a communal meal. Um, and she didn't mention what everyone else did. But I like that idea, too, of a skill no, challenge a idea. just upon entering into a village. Make some friends so that you can proceed with your adventure. What skill will you use to make friends? Right. Um, and then Rodney from Facebook. Now, I have heard of using skill challenges for travel to like speed up travel, right? You don't want to have to have them break camp every night, roll for, you know, uh, perception checks while you're taking watches and things like that. You speed up the travel. If it's two weeks of travel, you can just like roll for a day and see like, you know, are you guys navigating where you need to be going? Did you get lost? Um, there's weather involved. Um, and, but what they did was they counted each success as a reward. There would be a reward at the end of this. Um, and then failures resulted in combat. So while yeah. they're navigating, great. Now they've made it through, but now someone failed, I don't know, their survival check or what have you. And now there's combat because something happens, right? something happens. So, that is a neat way to speed it up. I like that. Yeah. You mm -hmm. can get through two weeks in, you know, just a matter of hours, <laughs> hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that well, and I see, me. I see a lot. I see a lot of these. I just got to say it, go back to Russell's one-on-one -on -one, uh -huh. uh, DMing that we were talking about, like putting together an artifact you would be doing more than one skill check on a one-on-one -on -one type of mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. There would be a lot of skill checks. There'd be involved. a lot of skill checks involved. So, well, yeah, unless it's unless it's really role-playing focused, which it's liable to be. You know, okay. because you're going to be. For example, I mean, I ran a one-on-one -on -one with a guy. I mean, now I'm going completely off topic. I should probably not go down that road. Um, it's late. It's late. We go way off topic late. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. We'll go, yeah. go, we'll go to get Save us. it for, we'll yeah. Save it for another time. Retcon yeah, yeah. All right. So we're okay. going to go to weekly world building. And I'm very excited because you want us to help you craft something. Eh? Yes. Yes. Ooh. I'm very excited about this. Um, so I watched... I watch a lot, a lot of documentaries. I love them. And I happened to be watching a documentary about animals and some such. And there was this ox pecker bird that uh, basically lives on large beasts and animals, zebras, elephants, what have you. And it's this symbiotic relationship where they like pick off the bugs and and uh, eat, you know, the, the bugs off of the large animals. And then... Um, trying to think what was the symbiotic relationship what they give to the birds and the birds do something for them i can't remember but Pick their teeth or something something the, right. but it it inspired in me i want to create some kind of a challenge where there is a gargantuan beast a colossal sized beast 
I mean, I'm imagining mm. like a, the biggest dinosaur brontosaurus that you can imagine and right. that there are some kind of birds that just fly around this thing no matter where it's walking there's always these birds that are flying around this thing and that the the adventure will be that they need to collect these birds the the point is not the colossal creature the point is they need to collect the birds the however birds, right? here's the thing that i'm trying to understand is like the speed of this creature and and i i'm in person so i have a a live battle map and i'm imagining imagine pringles cans right that's the size of their feet so there's going to be four pringle cans or whatever cans of food that are moving each turn what 30 feet 40 feet 60 i mean i'm looking at the the movement of colossal creatures some of them are like 40 to 60 feet so i'm then going to have to change the map to be like instead of one inch square being five feet it's maybe going to be mm. 10 feet each i don't know but I'm imagining that this creature is moving along and they're going to have to keep up with the speed somehow because eventually this creature will leave them behind. They're going to have to try to capture these birds without getting stepped on, without getting hit by this dinosaur, or maybe even without attacking, uh, attracting the dinosaur's attention. I'm saying dinosaur, but it could be whatever. Um, right. Because King then if they, if they get this creature's attention then maybe it will attack them and they will die <laughs> that's right. there's that's a guarantee so i'm really trying to understand how i can present and and mechanically make this work because well, i think the speed I'm, is yeah how would you do, do you, the way i've described it how would you do this if i, if I was going to do it i would cheat i would use theater of the mind i i would no map this would be no map you, you can't, I, I wouldn't try to do this with a map, but you could. And I think you're very brave to try, but it's going to be hard because you're going to be constantly redrawing it. Um, you could have terrain that you could float through the map. And so the map is more like a, a camera that's overhead of the beast, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the terrain could float through the map as it moves rather than having creatures moving through the map. Does that make sense? So the yes. characters could, it could be in relation to the beast rather than, um, yeah, I like that in relation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That might okay. work. I had trouble last night with a map that was 10 foot squares because players could never figure out where they were um, in, in relation to other mobs and what have you. But that, to be fair, they were smaller creatures. They weren't yeah. colossal creatures. So this might be. I guess I, guess I have a question, though. You, this... And you've got elevation, too, to consider. I, yeah, I elevation. Kinda have, I, I kind of have a question. Sure. Are you. This colossal creature has these birds. What size are these birds? Hmm. I, mean, I mean, they could be I, any I, size. I, I, or, or creature. Can, can you fly on the birds? They don't have to be birds, do they? They don't have to be birds, but okay, I imagine the them thing, to be the smaller. First thing, the, the first thing that just came out of my head, I, and I just see this as such a crazy idea, an iron golem. Mm-hmm. But it's rusty and it's filled with rust monsters and they have to get the rust monsters because oh. then it's like this incredible challenge to fight this incredibly hard monster. And, but then to get these things that are also incredibly challenging to get in the first place. And corrosive. As and fuck, corrosive yeah. as fuck. <laughs> rust monsters um, are the worst. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It's, it's kind of like a, it's a hell in a hell basket. But that was right. the first that was the first thing that came to mind was like, what is going to be, I guess it's my, it's my, my science mind. I don't see a, 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 a scavenger uh, hanging around something. I, I, I don't know. I, well, they, they might be, you know, like pilot, like sharks have pilot fish. Godzilla, around. Godzilla don't, Got, no kaiju has has a lamprey, right? They eat that damn thing. You know, well, what like if the these idea, are so though. small? Like, I do like the idea. Like I'm not whale saying, and krill, know. right? Whale, right. you know, krill are so tiny, you know, and yes, whales eat them, but they just open their mouth and like, ah, you know, they're not going to catch all of them. They just get right. what they get. So it could be a relationship like that where these things are flying around because no, they're you see, eating. But, that's, but see, but that's where you're wrong. It's not just they get what they get. You're not thinking about like, 
planet Earth where they like line up in circles and they're all spiraling together and there's 30 of them working together to get all the krill in a big cloud. And then you think about, oh, what if it was all aboliths? Yeah. <laughs> and aboliths are all, you know, you use animal behaviors on some of your monsters. Well, I love your idea. Okay, no, what about I, this? I, no, I'm, now you've you've got me thinking. What about instead of small flying creatures, whether they're birds or not, what if they are relevant in size to this colossal creature? What if they are big enough, like you said, like flying bats, right? And I was going to suggest giant bats. Yeah, giant or bats or what have you that maybe they use this creature Catch to one, sleep. Quiet. You know, they attach and they sleep on this thing because they know they're safe. But then when they're awake, if, they fly. But they're about also they all, food for how about this they thing. All, how about they all show up when it starts eating because they're going to eat leftovers? I mean, that's like sharks and and the big old groper fish, the gropers that are bigger than the sharks. Right? Yeah, but if it's eating, it's not they moving. Could be, they could be just picking off the salt from its skin. Yeah. Yeah. See, I like it, something like that. I want it to be flying around the creature. Symbiotic relationship, like okay, that. okay. It's just it's just it's sweat. It's just it likes eating. It's sweat. Like okay, it. all, right. all right. right. We're refining this. Okay, okay, okay. Just like I'm vampire bats, right? Because vampire bats like to um, they suck on the blood, right? Because they like the right. I think it's salt. And so, what if this colossal creature, whatever it eats, is salty, or like maybe it eats things from the ocean? So there's a lot of salt right. content in its blood. So then these creatures. Right fly around this thing because they just kind of mosquito attack it every once in a while. You could have magical blood too. That could be part of it. It could be magical blood as well. That's a great reason. Mm -hmm. So what if it has what if it has a parasitic slime inside of it? Right. So, wow. Well see here's the thing is I've already done a inside of a giant creature adventure, so I can't do that right no, now. No, I mean it would come <laughs> out. It would so, come out. It would, it would, okay. Okay. Horses. Horses can dash fast enough to keep up with it. So they could chase it on horses. They could feasibly catch bats. They move at the same speed as horses, um, 60 feet, and they can dash at 120, but they can fly as the, as the crow flies, so they can avoid the terrain uh -huh. and cut corners, you know. Um, and, and also your creature's going to be leaving big fucking potholes everywhere it steps, which is going to be difficult terrain too, right? Right, right. I love that. And oh, the potholes, yes. All right. Right, this reeking just destruction behind it. Okay. That's that's always a good thing to point out. Now, I right. love the idea it, of adding elevation, and I wonder if mm. instead so of... So climbing up things or... They need to getting get ahead of the creature? Yeah, they need to get ahead of the creature, or they need to... There's something on the head of this creature that they need. I don't know. So they, I, just, they I need to see slow if maybe it they down. Have to... They have yeah. to lead it somewhere into a valley, slow it down with a river or mud or some some obstacle. So when once it's slowed down, they can get in front of it and they can climb up something or build something in advance. So I don't know, a tower or, or a fucking ladder or climb up a tree that yeah. will get them high enough to actually do the thing they need to do at the right elevation. Yeah. Or it could be like a chasm that has multiple levels with sort of staircases or you know, different winding paths at different elevations. Well, they they got to build the pit with the fake cover. Right, right. Build the pit. Some, some kind of trap that, that will slow it down. But they really um, don't want the thing. They want the things that are flying around. They want around. the birds. Yeah. Right, right. or the creatures. Yeah, the creatures. right. The, the, the... Now, I guess I'm just going to put this out scarecrow. there. You know, there are some triple symbiotic relationships also. Okay. Right. Out there. Right. Where there's three creatures, three different creatures that work together. Right. So, I mean, just, you know, you can always throw something else in there as well uh, mm -hmm. as some, as part of their symbiosis. Yeah. Um, just to add that in your thought pattern. I am loving, I'm just trying to, I'm imagining them on horses. I'm almost imagining this like dune we talked about dune recently but when they yeah, try to capture the large well. worm you know you're right. racing to get to the right position and now you're right. trying to climb this thing well, they even had the thumpers right yeah, they had the thumpers, the thumpers to thumpers call it, ooh, it out. yeah ooh, they need something to call it right a yeah. drum or, or a magic item or a bell something. or a, a hollowed out bone of the creature right oh. or it could be a smell thing like sharks um, but I mean, I, I think the idea of things like chasms, for example, that rather than, I mean, you could have a, 
part of the chase could be up a chasm and part of the chase could be getting across another chasm. Um, and I'm seeing this monster slipping down the side of the chasm because oh. it, just because it's huge doesn't mean it doesn't make mistakes. It doesn't stumble. Oh. It doesn't trip. I was going to say, right. that might also be interesting to have it come upon a fortification where it has to use sieging to get through something, giving right. the players an opportunity to maybe – climb up or get some of the things right you could have a castle like that yeah and it could be multi-leveled and the players could be in the castle as this thing arrives and starts destroying it right I don't know. <laughs> oh my god i love this is this thing having that thing siege too is kind of a neat thing for the players to observe i gave yeah. a flying carpet to a player the other day oh no how's mm, that going for I might you have been a mistake well, to be fair, really well so far because he hasn't used it. He's keeping it hidden from the other players. Well, you have about to it. remember something though. All fly, I, flying carpet, and think of Doctor Strange's cape. They right. also tend to have their own personalities. So even though they think they can fly everywhere, they might not be able to. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Always, always. Right. Something's right. controlling that flying carpet. Well, right. I right. really appreciated doing did that with you guys. You? Yes, you did really did. Them? Because I feel like that was my problem was I couldn't really wrap my brain around all the different things that could be. And I think you guys have really come up with some great ideas for how I can do this. And it, and it just makes sense. Right. And I think the battle map, I think what you said. So a I'm bridge. imagining uh, like a, a VTT uh, map where I can move the scenery and not move the, no, the legs. You know, you know what I'm thinking of? When I was little, you make get the butcher paper roll. Yeah. So you can just roll it. Yeah. Right? And then I would, just I would cut out it's that keeps I would, rolling. <laughs> I would cut out the terrain in pieces, like mm -hmm. like trees and hills and things, and layer them on top. And yeah. then every round move them down. I parallel see what you're to saying. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Put them on a big treadmill so they can keep rotating. <laughs> yes, I will right? uh, I will get right on that, making a treadmill right? for my table. Right? A little treadmill. <laughs> and then they can keep going. Come <laughs> on, man. If you're going to do it, you got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, man. That's going to be great. I'll have to let you guys know. I, it's probably not going to happen until after this campaign is over. But Ooh, uh, that was, that's that was another fun. interesting. I want to see photographs of this, by the way, when it happens. Oh, sure. That was sure thing. Um, that was another really interesting YouTube I saw. This guy just released, he's been working on this single like setup for an adventure for two and a half years. Okay. Wow. And I thought about it. That's how long I've been at Dungeon Studios. And that's all this guy has been doing is painting minis, background, the, the set, the putting in the mini pieces. Wait, this is just for one, ter like one adventure, one, one terrain? One, oh. one thing. Wow. One thing. This is two and a half years of his mod. I, I was like, oh my gosh. All right. You're going to have That's to find I, that so that we I will, can I will, discuss I will it bring next the, week. I will put the link. I'll put the link in the game chat so we can talk about it. But cool. Intense, intense stuff. Awesome. Do we have any um, any any feedback on, on where the stream is? Because I still can't find it. No. No, I, but I Josh we can is say, on it. We can say this. We. Giddis will edit the whole thing together and we'll be back on YouTube and Spotify and all those things. In so the game chat, if they anybody missed. wants to try that link in the game chat, I mean, I'm showing it as active. I'm pulling it on all of my feeds. I've got two uh, people that haven't been able to find it besides me. Okay, so Josh so, just uh, said that there should be a link, a in, link the in the game chat. chat. So if anybody's hearing us, mm -hmm. I they wouldn't hear us if they're not on link the feed. Link in the game chat. But... I'm looking for it now. <laughs> Yeah. It's a game chat. Here we go. A link. There we go. Okay. No, this content is not available right now. I'm going to share it with a small group of people, probably. I wonder if it's a next. Maybe this it could be a settings public, like a who can see it setting thingy. Outside of the U.S. It's an outside of the U.S. You think so? Hit, probably. Yes. Well, that could be it. Facebook is very popular for the outside the U.S. crap. But it huh. let me see it before. Yeah, I mean, we had it set up and we switched over at some point. I don't know. Anyway, please remember, like, share, and subscribe. Dungeon Studios. Come on. Check yeah. us on our website. Support our studio. Um, Josh, I don't know. It was a backup. I saw it was down this week, the website. I, I have not checked recently. So uh, 
We're really working on our Facebook presence, so come give us a follow if you haven't already. Our YouTube uh, presence as well. You. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, likes, comment. Uh, we love to comment back. Help us break those uh, algorithms. algorithms that yeah. maths, right? Um, you can find us, our podcast on Amazon, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, um, all kinds of stuff, man. And join our Discord. We have yeah. a great little Discord. Um and we're on it all the time stuff. talking with folks. Yeah, we love talking about D and D, and we're there for you whenever you want. All right. Well, I will take us out tonight and say that Mondays can be fun days when you talk nerdy with friends, as I am here with Doc and Russell. So we'll talk to you guys next week. I think me and Russell Tuesday we might be here. here. Oh, it's Tuesday. <laughs> I'm going to have to change my outro. <laughs> I'm in the future. Hey, always remember, you always start out odd, but with a little effort and creativity, yeah. you'll always have the prime advantage. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. We'll talk to you next Good week. Night. Thank you. See you all at Discord. <laughs>